the most important event in human history in recent times was the decoding of the human DNA. Okay? Because this will basically allow us over the next century to eliminate almost all diseases, vastly extend human life expectation, and uh, these changes will be profoundly disrupting to society. Okay? And basically will be the final blow. Sounds like a fascist society. Mm, there's nothing really... All we, all we can say is that the current society, the current principles of morality will be shown to be irrelevant to everyone. There, of course, will be a few people, you know, who hold out, you know, just like there are people now who don't want to be vaccinated or crazy stuff like that. I mean, you know, but uh, the average person will basically see that the entire philosophical foundations of the human race are pretty much shot to hell because we can create life ourselves. We don't need any gods to do it, right? So, this is going to be the big thing. And we're going to see uh, basically more and more accelerating changes uh, as we go forward because about every five years there's a doubling in the scientific literature. Okay? So we're going to see more progress in the next... Well, basically every five years you see as much progress as you have seen in all previous history. You know? This doesn't comfort me. It should. It doesn't. If it doesn't, you're dead. <laughs> if it does, if what I'm saying does work, you could be living uh, in a thousand years from now. <laughs> uh, you mean I could live forever or a thousand years? My lifespan, you're, telling, you're speaking of a lifespan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not a question of living long, it's living well. Uh, well, what condition will you be in? But that's what you uh, imply, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sounds like a science fiction freak show. Potential. But I, 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 but I, just, I, just, I, I can, to be fair, I, uh, uh, I can theoretically see uh, some, something positive coming out of this, yeah. Yes, and a new world, completely different world, morally, yeah. Actually, I'd like to see the old morality thrown out the window. That's, uh, <laughs> I have that in common with this, uh, what do you call it, prediction. Yeah, I mean, you know. Okay. But in, in your own mind, if, if the old is, it, is, is this a hope for, are you able to tell the viewers that uh, this, is a, this is my hope for the future? It's not a hope. You're, you're it's inevitable. It. It's inevitable. Okay, okay. I mean, I'm, I mean, the only thing that could, if, if, you know, if scientific progress stops, then, of course, what I'm saying will not happen. But if scientific progress continues, then we will enter into a, a new age of bio biology. We will be in space, okay, spreading through the universe. <laughs> because we cannot stay on this planet. The sun is going to basically expand and s turn the earth into a cinder, right? But that will be in, uh, I don't know, 100,000 years. Much more than that, but the point is, Million years. I mean, there's two basic drives that people have. One is their own survival, and the other is the survival of their group. And our group, human beings, will not survive unless we go to another star. <laughs> okay. David Stadolsky. I got to get the pronunciation right. Uh, I didn't add the, the name Stadolsky. Is that uh, the... Slavic descent of some kind, Polish or what? It's a Polish name. It's a yeah. Polish name, okay. Yeah. And so I, I never got into uh, what I wanted to ask you initially. Uh, what is your uh, background, uh, what, your, your 
If your family, mother and father lineage, they come both from Poland? Well, my, my father was born in New York. Yeah, where did he come from? Huh? And where, where did his parents come from? Uh, they they uh, all came from uh, Central Europe. You know, my uncle was uh, in the Russian army. Uh, Soviet army? No. Well, Soviet, pre, pre, yeah, pre -Soviet, Soviet, yeah. Soviet, yeah. I mean, well, he was he was in the first and second world war on the Russian side. Okay, okay. okay so it was the okay Soviet. That's right. It was the Soviet. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. Uh, my mother was born in Poland, in some little town. Okay. So uh, you could say that uh, my ethnic background is uh, Jewish. Okay. Uh, you know. People who came from Poland and so on, uh, you know, Central Europe to the U.S. Uh, during the previous century. Okay. But uh, during, during the Nazi period, uh, your family was not in Poland or what? No, no. They were somewhere else. My mother was already in the, in the U.S. Yeah, okay. I mean, she was... So you never got experience that all this Holocaust stuff, you never... Your family never got into any. Uh, no, I'm not aware of anybody in the family who was directly uh, involved. I mean, the on my mother's side. I mean, my father was born in New York, so that was long ago, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but on my mother's side, uh, they basically sent one person, you know, to the U.S. and that person got a job and then earned enough money to bring everybody else. You know, okay. so uh, they they got out of Europe before the trouble. Good, uh, <laughs> good for them. <laughs> democracy is a decision-making procedure. Okay. Yeah. So it, you could apply that procedure in any group of people. So you know, in, in a capitalist society, well, so in a capitalist society, it's it's basically anti-democratic because it's based on private property. But, well, but, but many many people, the, uh, collective ownership of private property would make it democratic. Right. Well, well, the uh, the um, uh, I mean, the whole question of private property um, is not really uh, a direct contradiction to uh, democracy. I mean, no, because uh, because the people, the workers, can own the company collectively. Yeah, but yeah, that would be one. Or way. or or like it, like they say in America. Uh, if all, every worker can go out and buy some shares in anything. Yeah, that's nonsense. But that doesn't give democracy because it's only those who have the most <laughs> shares no, no, that no, they no, rule. No, no, I mean the uh, uh, fifty-one percent, and you rule. Yeah, yeah, but I mean that the uh, the, the, the the democratic decision-making process is really totally independent of all kinds of these economic things. I mean, the the the. Uh, There, there are uh, economic factors that might make you know democracy more or less likely, you know, but uh, there's uh, you cannot uh, make the kind of you know direct connection you're talking about. I mean, there's too many complications. I mean, so you know, a the basic idea of a democracy is that the citizens make the laws. Okay. Hey, uh, hey, I think I think what I was uh, really getting at, trying to get at, was: uh, Are you or is anybody working on democratic processes uh, at the universities, at the where the researchers are working? Is anybody doing studies there and working on this? Well, I mean, I, I'm there are certainly. Uh, studies on uh, how to organize the university, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, With democracy in mind, democratic universities, as opposed to, uh, what do you call it, uh, capitalist uh, companies, firms, uh, having too much influence. Well, I mean, the, I mean, if, you know, I mean, the idea of a, of a university is that it is a producer of knowledge, right? Right, and not just uh, taking orders from some damn capitalist company. Right, so, you know, that, that's really, uh, the university should be autonomous if it's really going to perform its but, function. But uh, isn't this what the, I mean, even the name, the Copenhagen Business School, 
isn't that uh, somehow <clears throat> a thorn in the eye of some people who actually believe in a university? No, because that's really an, uh, an applied science place. Okay, I mean it is the you know the distinction is that at the university people think, and at the business school they do stuff. You know, they actually do stuff. I mean, it's not clean but, cut, so but you, I mean. So you're, so you're saying that the capitalist companies have not gained more influence in in, in this uh, process, uh, the historical development of going from a, you know just the University of Copenhagen to having a. Danish Copenhagen Business School, which is on the same level as a university academically, uh, this is not something that represents more influence from business, the business sector. Well, I mean, you know, there's bound to be more influence from the business sector if what you're doing has to have an effect in the world. You know, that's... Is this, do you think it's a positive development? Well, that's not where I think the real problem lies right now. I mean, the problem is that the government has eliminated uh, democracy at the university. That's true at the business school. That's true at the Copenhagen so University. They, okay, the government has done it. Yeah. But they're taking orders from the business uh, section. Yeah. I mean, certainly the, the previous administration was a business front. Okay. You know, I mean, that's where their money came from, okay. right? That's their philosophy. Okay, but uh, my original they, question. They're trying to turn the university into a business, and they've basically turned it into a dictatorship, okay, because that's their idea of how to run a business, okay? I mean, they, the people in the previous government, the only thing they could understand was to motivate people was money, all right? And so they simply could not understand another organizing principle, okay? And uh, the effect of that was uh, to eliminate democracy at the university. Uh, eliminate what? Democracy. Democracy, yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it also was an attempt to concentrate power in the hands of the, this political group, uh, that was the previous administration, where basically uh, the universities became branches of you know, the education ministry, right? Okay. They, they, they lost their independence, whatever independence they had before. Do you have any hope for the future? Sure. Well, what's, uh, what's the hopeful strategy, strategy? Well, realistic strategy. Well, realistic strategy, I don't know, and on, on what level, I mean, I... <laughs> well, getting more democracy at the university. Well... Less uh, capitalist influence. Well, I mean, you're... Oh, wait a minute. Less, less bad capitalist influence. Well, I mean, I mean... Uh, Getting democracy. I mean, really they're, democracy they're, they're, I mean you're, you're juxtaposing two things that are really different. I mean, uh, the uh, capitalism is a type of economic organization, and, and uh, democracy is a form of political organization, okay? I mean, you can say that the distinction isn't that important, but, I mean, I think, you know, you really have to talk about those things in different ways. David Stadowski... You're an American scientist living in Denmark. Before you got here uh, to this so-called sexually liberated Scandinavian capital, Copenhagen, uh, you lived uh, in the States. So where were you born and, and uh, what, what is your background? Yeah, I was born in New York City and uh, when I was very small, my parents uh, moved to New Jersey. So I grew up uh, in central Jersey on a farm, and uh, I was there until I finished high school, pretty close. The, what, 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 what year is this? This is uh, 1964, okay. when I finished school. Okay, okay, high school. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, what, what did you do after high school? Well, I was uh, a student at the University of Michigan okay. as an undergraduate. What did your parents say to that? Then now you're moving to Michigan. Well, they, they just wanted to go from New York to New Jersey. And, well, and, and, well, then, and then you cut out and go to Michigan. No, no. Actually, uh, the situation was that uh, my father had died some years earlier. And uh, my mother died just before I finished high school. 
So I ended up with my brother, my oldest brother, who was at uh, the University of Michigan as a research associate at the time. And uh, therefore, I finished my last semester of high school in Dexter, Michigan, a little town just outside of Ann Arbor, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I began uh, my studies at the University of Michigan in 1964. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I lived in the United States in Salt Lake City, Utah, and uh, graduated from high school there, and even went uh, a couple years to the University of Utah. Uh, when I got there to study at the University of Utah, uh, I, my, my parents, my, my, I, I, my family is a Danish family, that immigrated to Salt Lake City when I was five years old, yeah. and uh, then I went into the army. And uh, and uh, <coughs> while I was in the army, I told them I wrote letters to them and said I'm not coming back to the states because it's it's too nice over here in Europe. I don't feel like going back. But and uh, when I and then and then before I was discharged, they told me that uh, uh, we're we're leaving the states too, so we're going to meet you in in, in Europe. Uh, but what happened was they went to Copenhagen. And I was discharged from the army, and they wouldn't let me be discharged in Europe. I had to go back to the states. So uh, I was I landed alone, without a family, in Salt Lake City, and that was not really my intention. Uh, and uh, and that was a kind of a difficult situation because I had no money. I had I wasn't prepared for anything. <laughs> uh, somehow I managed to get a couple of years of uh, education, but it was extremely difficult. Anyway, uh, that's why I, um, I'm a little bit surprised and uh, impressed that you're not dead and gone, being alone in Michigan, without uh, alone. You was with your brother, but your your fam the family support was gone. Yeah. Right. And uh, you have your brother to help you. Uh, how did you get along financially? What other kind of support did you have? to get started in your university education after high school? Well, you have to realize that the uh, situation in the U.S. at that time uh, was very good for students. And, and the reason for that was that uh, the Russian Sputnik had created a shockwave uh, in the Congress and they immediately decided that they had to improve education and so they passed what was called the National Defense Education Act. And basically the National Education, National Defense Education Act meant that if you were qualified to attend the university, then the money was there. Was it free education just like in Denmark? It was... Tuition free? free? Well, no. We, I mean, the, the tuition was covered by these funds. Okay. So you actually didn't pay tuition? I think somebody else paid it for Somebody me. else paid it for me, huh? right. And uh, then uh, when I was in graduate school, that had run out, you know, but then they had passed the National Defense Education Loan. Somebody's on your side. Uh, and uh, the uh, National Defense Education Loan was pretty much the same deal, except you had to pay it back, unless you started teaching at the university. And if you were a teacher, then in every year that you were teaching, you would get 10% deduction, okay? And finally... You get a 10% deduction? Of what you owed. Okay. Okay, so 10% of the loans forgiven for each year you, you taught. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, then one day I finally got a letter from the bank saying, look, this is costing us more to collect than it's worth, uh, forget it. Uh, they didn't say that, but that was really what happened, okay? So you, uh, the, the, the debt was canceled? Yeah, what was left. I mean, I did well, pay most of it. You paid most of it, but then the rest was canceled, yeah. okay. Yeah, but I mean, this was basically a direct effect of the Russian Sputnik and the moon race that had ensued immediately there. Well, did, did that make you a, a Russian sympathizer to the extent that you became a, a, a spy for the Soviet Union at that time? No. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think I even realized it at the time. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You know, the United States really needs something. Right now, the exact opposite. You're, you had the education benefits, very good benefits. Now, it's, it's a, a catastrophe of debt to all students. 
Yeah, well, well the most yeah. I mean, I, I also worked at the university, you know, so the, the, the loans were not the you only... You had a job at the university yeah. doing something? What did you do? Well, I was... Wash uh, dishes or what? No, no, I had some uh, basically research, you know, money. You, you, were, you were able to do research as a student before you're finished and qualified for doing research. Well, I, I was doing research as a PhD student. Okay, but I mean that was at the later that the, that was that was the, the much last later. years. The yeah, last yeah, years but I mean the before that you must have washed some dishes. Uh, no, no, uh, the uh, the funding was generally covered by the by the government. Uh, I mean after this, uh, I mean I had additionally uh, we've been granted a uh, stipend by the uh, the uh, health department in the U.S. Uh, the the, they had something, an administration having to do with alcohol and drugs and so on. And uh, since I was a psychologist, they were funding these kind of things, you know. And so a, a lot of that money was given as part of the uh, way that health was being promoted in the United States. Okay. And then I had also, I had, was able to get money by, uh, for instance, at the University of California for doing research. Um, okay. For my own research. Uh, so and friends? What? No, no. This was nepotism. No, no, no. <laughs> this was just like uh, money was the the University of California wanted to improve education, and I was doing something with, you know, uh, uh, related to that. So they were willing to give me some small amount of money, and then this uh, small amount of money was sort of tripled because uh, there was some subsidy for students, you know, who were working, so that if yeah. you if the university paid one fourth, then the government, federal government, would throw in the other, or the state government. I don't remember. Okay. So you know, uh, there were many different sources of money. I mean, this was a different era. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and uh, different universe, <laughs> another planet. <laughs> well, certainly, uh, for people who are getting an education in the U.S. these days, it must seem like it. You know? <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, you said psychology. You, you, you were doing a PhD and uh, you got a PhD in something? Was that psychology? Yeah. Uh, did you study anything else? Like, uh, was there any IT technology at that oh, time? Oh, yeah, there was. MIT was doing something. Well, I mean, this, you too? There, were, there was a computer science department. I took a lot of uh, courses. I actually. What, what year are we in now? Well, uh, it was, we talked about I was, okay, just, you graduated uh, from high school, right? Yeah. So in, uh, I was so at, at this time, you know, uh, it was not only a lot of money available for students, mm -hmm. but there was a sort of an overload of students at the university, you know, because of all this money and then all these students of course, were coming, you know, okay. and, and, and uh, that was the government's objective to get more highly educated people. Okay. okay so the university had become overloaded so they switched to a system where instead of having two semesters a year they actually had three summer, so, summer was one of them right so you could have in the summer they had half semesters two but if you took two half semesters that was equivalent to a semester in the okay. summer okay okay so um and then of course uh, you know there's all kinds of research going on and i had research jobs for instance my first research job at the university was at what was the Cooley Electronics Laboratory. Cooley? Yeah. What's his name? C-O-O-L-E-Y. Okay. Some, I don't Some know who we call Cooley. Some Cooley, yeah. <laughs> uh, What's a Cooley? It's a slave, isn't it? Uh, no. no. no okay. so, so, right, so, so anyway, okay. um, this, I had a job there uh, under a contract that the university had gotten from the uh, Defense Department to build a laser communication system. Okay. Sounds complicated. And uh, the later, I I also had another job at uh, the Mental Health Research Institute. Okay. Getting close to psychology. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what else? I I vaguely remember there was another job hey, in there somewhere. Did, like, did I get it right? Did you go into some studies in computer science, computer something? Well, I I was already working with computers. As an undergraduate, okay, because... Working with them, but not studying. Right, because we had one of the first computers in that laboratory, mm -hmm. okay, the, what was called the Link 8. You were uh, into the pioneer phase. Right, so um, I, I was uh, able to do a little bit with that, 
and a little bit uh, on the IBM 360, which was one of the early mainframe computers. Okay, so I had had a little bit of contact with the with the mainframe computer and with the mini computer. Okay, in the laboratory, and uh, then I started taking courses in computer science. In fact, I was actually admitted to the University of Wisconsin as a graduate student in clinical psychology and computer science. That's a kind of a strange combination, but fascinating. Right. It, it actually did not work because you know the psychology people thought this was a great idea as long as I did all of the requirements for computer for psychology. <laughs> and the computer so science. Be your hobby, right? and, so, and the computer science people also yeah. thought it was a great idea as long as I did all the requirements for computer science. <laughs> so uh, this clearly was not a very good situation, you know. And uh, I uh, ended up um, getting my degree, in a master's degree in uh, in psychology. Okay. okay. So master's degree, PhD. I, 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 I've, I've forgotten what all of these titles actually Well, the, the first, well, you have a master's degree, then you get a PhD afterwards? Or right. How, in, the, in the American system, you get a bachelor's, typically uh, would be a, uh, a bachelor's of arts, what they call. Yeah. Because yeah. the... the MA, master's of art, or what? Uh, you could get a master's of art, yeah, that's, uh, or master's of science. Uh, the psychology was considered to be a, a master's of art, yeah. And then you go on to the PhD. So uh, you normally have s a two or three years for a master's, and uh, then uh, you go on to f do independent research for a couple of years and get the PhD. Uh, I've heard okay. someone use the uh, title of uh, BS, Bachelor of Science. Is that, that could be a Bachelor of Science, yeah. Okay, then, so even at a bachelor's level, you have Bachelor of Science, Bachelor, whatever subject you're main subject you're yeah. studying. Yeah, uh, well... Uh, bachelor of Arts, Bachelor of Physics, Bachelor I mean, of uh, Psychiatry? I mean, I, that might be more recent because I think uh, the BA was uh, also for science people at that time. I don't know. But, uh, okay. But I mean, it is, this, uh, it is basically four years as an undergraduate, okay, uh, after 12 years of, of primary education, okay? Yeah, right, 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 right. And then... You have your four undergraduate years, and then basically the general idea is, is maybe two, three years for a master's, okay, which is really sort of a, a booby prize uh, that's handed out to people who can't go on to the PhD uh, in these kind of programs. But for professional people, like if you want to become, you know, a therapist of some sort, you know, physical therapist, you might be able to get a a degree, a final degree as a master's, okay? Okay. okay. So there are, there are uh, people who find, you know, who do go just to get a master's, but for somebody who's going to be a researcher, that's just a step on the way. Right. And so you some wanted, people you may want, not do it at all. And you knew you wanted to be a researcher, so you went on to get a PhD. Yeah. Okay. Are, have we covered all of the things that you have studied now at the university? Uh, well, not, not all of them, but I'll bring in a few more details, I think. Yeah, I mean, good. the, uh, I mean, uh... Please mention anything that you'd like about that is relevant in any way, or interesting, whatever. Yeah, I would, I would say that, you know, the, uh, the my psychology ended up being heavily uh, in the direction of social and political psychology. Okay. You are nearing sociology. Well, there is, I uh, consider myself to be a social psychologist. Okay. Okay. So social psychologists uh, uh, study groups of people. Okay. And perception of groups and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sociologists really tend to study something else. I mean, yeah. so there's two types of social psychology. There's the Psychological social psychology, and then there's a sociological social psychology. Okay? <laughs> but I, okay, great, but great. I did indeed have contact with sociologists uh, in, mm -hmm. in my education, uh, which actually can, I was actually at Stanford for my final education. I was there on a postdoctoral fellowship. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, did you finish anything there? Did you, you were there just doing it, or did you? Well, I finished with a degree. Or well, you don't get else? a no. You're you you do not get a degree as a po uh, a postdoc. I mean, uh, you, 
you know, that's... You get something in your CD? Yeah, well, you know, you have basically, a postdoc is basically, uh, you're doing research, uh, okay. pretty much okay. under your own power. And, okay. and uh, yeah, so it's, it's very similar to having a job, but the, uh, usually you you're, have more flexibility because you're not really working uh, for anybody. Is uh, it much more satisfying when you get to that level? Oh yeah, because you know you don't have you know required courses. I mean, you can go to courses, but you don't it's have to. It's more your own interest that right. determine whatever you do. Yeah, it is. It is a period generally when you don't have like teaching responsibilities or things like that, uh, or, or very little. You what know. about your uh, financial situation? Well, this postdoc was. Is that better than when you were teaching? When you're teaching. Uh, is that no. also better or worse? Well, <laughs> uh, I mean, teaching is, is, is uh, if it's the normal tenure track, then you're getting more, generally getting more money. When, when you got into this, where you're, this situation, yeah. uh, where you're free to research and do more things on your own, yeah. was your economic situation better or worse or the same as the previous five years? It was slightly better, but not much. Okay. I mean, because it was basically still the money was coming from the from the government as a stipend, you know. Okay. Okay. Uh, Did you ever get into so-called real uh, uh, work and wages from the uh, godlike private sector instead uh, of the, instead of government uh, wages? Well, let me think. Uh, well, no, not as a full time. I mean, I had some consulting work, but uh, not as a job. I know I don't. Not well. I did certainly have summer jobs as a student. Do you think this is a leftover for from your sympathies toward the communist Soviet Union <laughs> <laughs> that you cling to government, uh, whatever financing? Or no, this is just a standard. It's, it's just uh, the way. It, that, that's the way it was for everybody, huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, sort of, if you want an academic career, you typically. I mean, you could be working at a private university, okay, yeah. uh, or a public university, but it doesn't make. Or, or, or into pharmaceuticals, where the uh, pharmaceutical industry will probably pay a hell of a lot to get somebody to do exactly what they want. Yeah. Uh, that never, that never passed your mind. No, your mind, right? no. I mean, I, I had my own research program, so I was not interested in going and doing somebody else's stuff. You know. Okay. Uh, you want to mention some more things? I think that covers it. I mean, in terms of the education. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I could comment a little bit about uh, the social life in America, which is... Right, right, uh, right. That's what I wanted to get into. What, bef before you comment <laughs> at some time on Danish social life, uh, what about social life in America? What, what's, what's your, from, from the time you were born uh, until you left the, the States, uh, what, ha what, 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 how, how did your opinion of the American social life uh, develop? Did you have one? Well, I, I would say one, that uh, as I, be I became more and more aware of the social and political situation in the U.S. as I got older, okay, okay. and had some experience. Okay. Uh, like, for instance, uh, one experience was uh, filing a lawsuit against the federal government Oh, that's that's good stuff. That's good for TV street space. Really. Okay. <laughs> we want right. to get... So I can tell you a little bit about that. Say, say something about that. Okay, well, the the uh, situation was that uh, when I entered uh, the uh, University of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. okay, as a clinical psychology graduate student, the uh, federal government was getting a lot of uh, trouble because... Uh, there had been this war going on in Vietnam for quite some time, and uh, the bodies coming back were all black. Uh, and the reason for this was because the white students were going to college and getting student deferments, or had, had other kinds of connections, you know, so they could get off uh, without going into the military. Um, so the government decided, well, this had to be solved because it was a, getting to be a you know, PR problem. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it, should, it should be. And so they say, well, what we'll do is we will eliminate all these student deferments. Oh, yeah. And the uh, <laughs> thing is, if we eliminate all these student deferments, then we'll have this overload of 
people coming into the selective service system, which is what they call the military conscription in the U.S. And uh, therefore, we will have a lottery to select which ones will go to Vietnam. All right. Okay. Well, the, uh, I was one of these students that was included in this lottery. And then... Wasn't everybody forced to go get into the lottery? Everybody well, that was eligible for being a soldier were, uh, of these students or whoever? Well, every, everyone they, who everybody. was eligible in that year, okay. students and, okay. who had, okay. had had their deferments uh, terminated and anybody else, okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and uh, a lottery was held to select who was actually going to be taken into the military that year. So, uh, being one of these students, I had an interest in this process. And uh, when I was over at the computer science department mm -hmm. one evening, uh, after this lottery, someone had drawn a picture on the blackboard uh, showing the average score okay, for each month of the year in this lottery. And uh, it was clear that the people towards the end of the year were getting much better chance of being inducted into the military and sent to Vietnam for some reason. So having studied a little bit of statistics, I felt this was not really very likely that this would appear. And I ran a statistical program to determine exactly uh, how likely it was. And, uh, I discovered that there was only one chance in 50,000 that this result would occur by chance. So uh, armed with this knowledge, I went down to the local Associated Press office and said, this lottery is not right. Uh, look, uh, it's only one chance in 50,000 that would have come out that way. You ought to get this. Manipulated fraud or whatever you call it. And so the guy said, well, okay, whatever. But I mean, if it's, uh, you know, not a court case, I mean, you know, it's not... It's nothing we can do. Uh, how do you have any environmental news? That's what's hot right now. So, so uh, after I got this news, I decided, okay, well, if it's going to take a court case, then I'll have to find a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to pay for it. Yeah, that's the other problem. Okay. So um, I was able to locate a, a lawyer, and a, a case was filed in the federal district court. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And the, the headline in the paper the next day was Draft Foe and Attorney General Play High Card. Draft Foe? I was the Draft Foe, the enemy oh, okay, of the draft. Okay, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the Attorney General was, of course, the prosecutor. Okay. 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 And uh, he had laid out a deck of cards on the table and asked me to pick one at random, okay, and uh, he, this was part of his argument to show that I could have picked any card, you know, and so on and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was how the headline uh, came to be in the paper, okay? I, ho I hope he didn't win his point. Well, his point was, you know, not related to the, the problem because obviously if there's a row of cards laying on the table, you could pick any card just as easily where if you have a, a, a jar with this big stack of, of capsules in it, you know, you're more likely to take one off the top, right? Right. Especially right. if you're convinced that they've all been mixed up. Okay. But it wasn't true that they'd all been mixed up, okay? Mm -hmm. And therefore, there was a bias, right. okay? And that's how it ended up that so people who won, born... So the court case? Well, the court case was uh, never tried be be because the judge felt that there was simply not enough evidence there to stop the induction of all of these men into the military. So he mm -hmm. uh, was not willing to issue what's called a temporary restraining order. Mm -hmm. But he was willing to put the case on his calendar. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, that means that it comes up, you know, a couple years later. And by this time, all of the 13 men that had been involved in that court case uh, were gone into some other uh, situation, yeah. either Canada or whatever, you know, medical problems. or mm -hmm. So there was really nobody left to carry the case forward, no. okay, okay, when it came up. But you tried. 
Well, I mean... It must uh, have drawn some attention. Maybe they uh, got a little something. Uh, might, under, under the table, back uh, behind the scene, maybe somebody was you know, trying to do a little better or, or just getting better at covering things up. I don't know. Well, I mean, um, it really wasn't possible for them to prevent the publicity. Okay. Which, what, was, was there a lot of publicity? Yeah. And, and did you, uh, <clears throat> did you uh, win, win some support? Or did, they, did the criticism of the, uh, uh, of the way the system worked, did, well, did that grow? The... Well, certainly. I mean, this was just another example of the incompetence of the Nixon administration. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was, it gave me an opportunity to go on TV and denounce Richard Nixon as a war criminal before it became popular. You did that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, okay. Okay. It, it also gave the head of the psychology department an, uh, an excuse to kick me out of the, of the university. They, uh, did they actually do that? Yeah. Okay. I mean, do, do, do you have uh, this frame? Uh, the, the getting kicked out must have been, you must have gotten a letter or something that said, you're, no, you're, no, you're no. kicked out. No. And then you put it into a frame and hang it on your wall. No, what like happened? Wall. No, well, what happened was um, that uh, I became extremely well known in the town, no, no, and no especially tor notorious, in, or well, or for some, and famous with others. Right, and and I was famous, of course, with the students. Yeah, right. Great, good. Who elected me to public office? <laughs> Okay. What does that mean, uh, to public office? For well, what? student public office? No, no, this, this is a uh, account was of the, uh, I was what was called a uh, member of the uh, county supervisor, which, okay. which is like okay. uh, the, uh, it would be in Denmark, where you used to have these Amt. In the Amt, yeah, okay. And okay. Uh, so that. Uh, you could have an election to the people running the Amt, and that's basically okay. what the county supervisor was. Okay. So it was not being on the city council, okay, mm -hmm. which, oh, okay. but on the county council, yeah, basically, okay. okay? Yeah, yeah. So I was placed on the, uh, a couple of committees, uh, including the public health committee and the home room study committee, you know, everybody who is serving mm -hmm. in an elected position gets committee work and so on. Yeah. And uh, this uh, placed me in a position where I was supervising one of the health, uh, mental health facilities in the county. And the, the uh, Department of Psychology had students working, you know, mm -hmm. there yeah. uh, as part of their training. And uh, they did not look fondly upon having a student uh, there, you know, <laughs> <laughs> who would be uh, sort of on the wrong side of right, the uh, right, right. power pyramid, right? <laughs> okay. And, oh, that's uh, great. Yeah, really, that's good. Good stuff. So uh, basically what it came down to was the chairman of the department declared he was not going to sign this form that uh, had to be signed so the government could pay my tuition. Mm. Okay, because I already had the government committed to paying my tuition at the university, yeah. but it, of course, had to be signed by the department head to show that I was actually at the university. And he declared that he would not sign this thing, and oh, uh, he would rather go to jail. They're going getting rough now. Yeah. So, uh, I decided that if I sent the chairman of the department to jail <laughs> for intimidating a public official, this probably would not be looked fondly upon later in my career as a psychologist. <laughs> okay. So uh, basically I wrapped up my work at the University of Michigan and then went to the University of California. I mean the Mid University of Wisconsin. Wisconsin, yeah. right, 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 right. Okay. Uh, so I, I uh, basically had to restart my research at the University of California yeah. in 1972. We were actually talking about uh, your social life, and uh, uh, now we're into education again. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I mean, this is just just illustrates the sort of the repressive atmosphere in the country 
Okay. Yeah, which is social life, repression of social life. I don't know. Well, I mean, if you, you know, I mean, if, if you spoke out, uh, well, you know, too bad. You know, nobody was going to protect you. I mean, you know, it's free okay. speech, but... Uh, Live with the consequences. Right. Or die with them. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, the... Not uh, much freedom in that. No. So, uh, but I mean, in, in, uh, that was the sort of the political atmosphere. I mean, I really mentioned this just to explain how I sort of became more interested in these kind of issues. In, and I became more, much more politically alert and aware, you know, as to what was going on in the, in the U.S. by having this involvement. I got to get back to the, right. now. This is the, uh, what, what's the year now? I'm losing track a little bit of this. This is where in Well, I, I, I went to the University of California. Four, no, we're 72. 72. Yeah. Uh, I would say is when I went to the University of California. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, um, but anyway, the, if to, to give just a general characterization of, this, of, yeah. of the, the social climate yeah. in the U.S., uh, I would say that uh, you have uh, sexual repression, okay, yeah. uh, which is manifested in, in many ways, bad attitudes towards women, censorship, you know, and, and uh, lack of availability of contraception. You have racism, mm -hmm. uh, which is directed against black people and uh, Mexican descendant, people of Mexican descent right now, uh, and now also Muslims, of course. Also Indians. Yeah, well, anybody who's different. American Indians. I mean, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anybody that's different. There is non-white Anglo-Saxon. Right, right. And, and, and then there is a lot of religious fanaticism. I mean, about one-third of the people in the U.S. believe in evolution. So that <laughs> gives you an okay, idea. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So... Um, you, you uh, basically have uh, a cover story, you know, the home of the free and the land of the brave, but uh, the U.S. has the largest prison population of anybody percentage-wise in the world. A percentage, uh, is it, uh, it's, it's bigger percentage-wise, it's also bigger than China. Yeah. Uh, percentage-wise. Yeah. What about absolute figures? That's I'm not, China, I'm not, China, I'm China not. China must, I don't know. Do. I don't know. I, I really don't know for sure. Okay, okay. Uh, but I mean, it has... Uh, become a re the prison system has sort of become a replacement for the uh, previous uh, what was called Jim Crow, you know. The, yeah, the, right, right. Okay, the, the, mostly blacks or other non-whites. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so, about one third of all blacks <clears throat> in the U.S. are under the control of the penal system in some way. You know, this reminds me a little bit. Uh, this guy uh, Max Kaiser on Russia Today. Yeah. Uh, I, I, he's my uh, economic guru yeah. for the time being. Yeah. And um, anyway, he, <laughs> the latest thing he was covering was uh, the uh, there, there are not too many jobs in America. And uh, actually, they're not becoming, just against everything that Obama and other people are saying over there, that, oh, we're getting, there are more jobs now. Well, actually, they're just part-time jobs. They're selling pizzas temporarily or something else. Real jobs, long-time jobs are really, they're, they're disappearing. <laughs> they're not, they're not, we're not getting more of them. Uh, so Max Kaiser uh, got into the idea, well, uh, if they want a job, um, there are plenty of opportunities in the United States. All you have to do is you uh, just uh, go and uh, get, get convicted for uh, three strikes and you're out, you know? Yeah. Go to prison. Man, there are lots of jobs there. Yeah. You, know, you can work in prison. Okay, you, and, and, and it's good for the country. It's patriotic because, I mean, it makes America, all of these people, if everybody gets into the prison, just everybody, work for nothing, you know? <laughs> for, <laughs> You can outcompete the Chinese. Really? Right. You, well, of course. You I mean the wages will be lower than they are in China and India, maybe even lower than they are in Somalia. Man, you, the United States will again be on top of the world. <laughs> I think yeah. it's, so, it's so funny. Max yeah. Kaiser, Russia Today. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, yeah. get back to your thing, man. Sure. Okay, so the. The other, the other thing you know, that uh, you're interested in knowing is how, the, what influence this social climate had on me. Uh, yeah, if you uh, at, were you, it sounds to me like you were completely uninfluenced negatively. On the contrary, um, you're doing some very ethical, uh, the way I hear it, ethical, uh, moral, uh, humanistic, uh, all the good things. You're responding good to racism and and warmongering <laughs> and the Nixon criminality. You're good. You're, you're yeah, well, but, uh, yeah, I so mean, it, it, it can't, that doesn't sound like a negative influence. So you've well, gotten out of it. 
I would say the major, I mean, the major influence was really on something that was really never really spoken about in the U.S., which is the basically the this sexual repression. I mean, you know. Okay, that's uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, I, I the, that was I think the major thing that affected me really, and that was uh, resulted in me having a rather late sexual debut. Yeah. And 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 uh, I attempted to conform to sexual monogamy, uh, which didn't work. And uh, that I would say is the major effect of the social climate on me because it also had a very negative. I lived in Salt Lake City, the Mormon state. Yeah. That the, the, the whole atmosphere over there was uh, very bad for my sexual development. Yeah. So that was that, that, <laughs> it was a liberation when I got to Denmark. Yeah. But anyway, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, say some more about uh, the sexual repression, uh, limited uh, freedom of speech, uh, social life was, uh, what's the best thing you can, wait a minute, I just got, the hippie movement was in 68, or uh, it, talk, it talked about that, it maybe from 64 to, on to the Vietnam War started in the, in the beginning of the 60s, it became known probably when I was in the army, 60 to 63, it was getting, Around. Yeah, it took a long time. It took a long time. Yeah. Uh, the hippie movement was a, a was a, a movement for freedom of sex and everything else that is humanistic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and right now we got we were talking about 1972. Uh, so the hippie movement had been going on for four years uh, at least. Yeah, I would. I was sort of. I mean, I was born in 1945. Okay. Okay. And in the U.S., we had this baby boom. You know, after yeah. the war. Yeah, yeah. But that was a little bit later, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was, and the, the hippie uh, uh, uprising or, uprising, whatever, yeah. or mobilization or whatever you want to call it uh, started sort of uh, in the cohort a little bit earlier. I mean, you know, the people who are a little bit younger were the ones who were sort of affected by that most. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. And so it, it eventually caught up with me, mm -hmm. okay, at the end sort of, of my uh, undergraduate career. All right? Okay. Uh, so... Uh, Better later than never. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I was sort of in, in that social model, uh, you know, when in... Uh, yeah, I would say in graduate school, primarily, yeah. Okay. So, um, what did we just conclude? That uh, uh, with respect to sexuality, there was maybe a, a negative influence? Yeah, I and, think so. Uh, <clears throat> but as far as I can see on uh, the way you responded to a sick society, racist society, was certainly not... Negative. Yeah, well, I mean, my family had always been trying to counteract these inf bad influences, you know. You had good parents that protected you. That, uh, well, they, yeah. for instance, my, my, my parents made sure, you know, that I had contact with some black people who lived nearby and so really? on. Really? They were conscious of this? Oh, yeah, and they made a big point that one of my relatives had married a black guy, you know. <laughs> uh, oh, and, great. Uh, and great. stuff like that. So, you know, th they were uh, totally <laughs> opposed to any kind of religious nonsense okay uh and and uh, did they believe in evolution certainly yeah they're into the science thing okay great then uh, this uh, 19 this when did you leave what was the date when you left the united states 1984 january what did you do from 72 to 84 well i was a graduate student at the university of california irvine Okay, and there I was primarily doing psychology, but also uh, related things, com many computer science related things. Uh, then I had a postdoc period at uh, University of California, Berkeley, uh, at a place I was in connect, I was connected with somebody in sociology there uh, as a sponsor and uh, worked at a center for research on business stuff, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I don't, it was Center for Research, C-R-I-M-S, what was it again, Crim, uh, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was a business school type thing, a little okay. center, yeah. you know, on basically in the basement, 
of the building the psychology department was in, so I was put down there. Okay, you know, okay, as, building the foundation. As, as, <laughs> as a postdoc. And, and uh, then I went to the education uh, department, the, well, the Center for Research on Education at Stanford. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, to the psychology department at Stanford. And uh, I finished my postdoc there at the at Stanford University. Okay, so that was the end of my studenthood. I mean, uh, the University of California considers postdoc to be employees, but the Stanford University considers them to be students. Okay, so uh, um, that brings us up to date on. Eight nineteen eighty four. Oh no no well then uh, I had. My first job at uh, Stanford, uh, I left that to take a regular uh, teaching job at the uh, University of Louisville in Louisville, Kentucky, mm -hmm. where I met up with Southern Hospitality, <laughs> which I hadn't had any exposure to was before. There a, was there a, a black uh, servant? Or? Well, the, I mean, I had never been able to understand, you know, why the U.S. was engaged in such idiotic policies. Foreign policies, all right. Like what? Like all these wars, constantly, oh, okay. and you know okay. stuff like that. And uh, then I had this first contact with the Southern mentality. Okay, and this wasn't the Deep South because Louisville was actually in the North. It is about uh, six hours. Louisville, what state? Kentucky. Kentucky, yeah. yeah. Kentucky is just below Indiana. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which is a northern state. It's a borderline state, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. Louisville is considered to be a border town yeah. due to the fact that the uh, influence comes up the Mississippi River. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's not called the Mississippi there, but that's w w how the sort of influence gets up there, even though you're only like six hour drive from Chicago, which is about as north as you can get, <laughs> you know, in the U.S., you know. Okay. So uh, this is a border town. Yeah. And uh, then I could see uh, racism, sexism, ageism, all, the, all of those things were very... It were, became very visible there. Yeah. As, well, a, as know, opposed to farther north. Yeah, it, I mean, it, it was, was the kind of thing where visible. if you would go you could on... see it immediately. Oh, yeah, like if you would go on a demonstration, so let's say a peace march or something, when you get to the church, which was the end point for the demonstration, yeah. the Ku Klux Klan would have been there and nailed a sheet to the door. Okay. Uh... In 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 nineteen eighties and in the nineteen seven in the yeah nineteen and, and it's and, not still going on, is it? Well, maybe sometimes. I mean, when Ronald Reagan was elected, you know, the head of the Ku Klux Klan says, "Well, we've got our guy in. Now we can go home." <laughs> <laughs> oh God, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's certainly. I mean, you certainly still have. Clan activity. I mean, uh, you have many different kind of militias. You know, you know this, skinheads. This, this guy, uh, Yak, Danish guy called Jakob Holt, and the American yeah. pictures that right, right. a lot of people know of. Yeah. He sort of neutralized the negative image of the Ku Klux Klan. Have you noticed that? Well, I know he tried to. I mean, he tried I, to neutralize. You know, I mean, I, I think his. Yeah. I mean, I think his his approach is sort of naive in a way. You know, but. Uh, it might work a little bit for some people. Who well, I mean, the, I mean, the racism is is not a thing. It is part of the system, okay. And if the political system is dependent upon divide and rule, yeah, then you're going to have the racism because that's what's needed to divide. And then right? it doesn't help just to go and talk individually to a couple of guys. So. Well, you could talk to a couple of guys, and meanwhile, the the, the system has generated. A, Couple of million more guys, right? I mean, right. Yeah. yeah, it's much faster, much more productive. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, uh, okay. You left the states. How did you leave the states? You fly? Did well, you swim or take a boat? I or what? Uh, when I reached Train? the when I <laughs> took my first regular teaching position at the University of of uh, of Louisville, uh, I decided I had switched out of psychology because I felt that the whole profession of psychology was uh, ethically compromised, okay? And I joined the Sociological Society, the American Sociological Association. Okay. And uh, 
I decided that uh, the U.S. was going downhill. <clears throat> Absolutely. You can convince me. So, I decided I'd have to find somewhere else to go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you came to a completely conscious conclusion, this place is I'm not, getting too I'm, bad for me. Well, at the time, okay, uh, I was doing research on uh, democracy in the workplace. Okay. okay. Yeah. And uh, I felt this would, if I was going to develop com uh, computer networks, you know, to support democracy in the workplace, it really ought to be done somewhere where there was democracy. <laughs> I was just going to ask you. Because it's like a needle in a haystack, right? Over in the States, isn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, <laughs> you know, when you build a, uh, an information system, the assumptions in the surrounding society sort of seep into it no matter what you do right. and so I, I felt I'd have to go somewhere where there's, where there's democracy if I was going to build this kind of system uh, and also I was getting more and more discouraged with the political dynamics in the US okay so uh, I made a conscious decision to look for something else and uh, at, at that time you had no idea that Scandinavia was part of it or, or no what I did was, I, uh, I one day, uh, the journal of the American Sociological Association arrived on my desk, and somebody had done a study of the, uh, uh, had constructed an index of the democracy, how to measure democracy in different countries. And he had compared his index to some index that had been done uh, 10 years earlier or something. And uh, the things hadn't changed much, okay? In the States? Well, in the ranking of the countries. Okay. Okay? So what I did was I took the 30 most democratic countries off this list. And I went to the... The United States was not one of the 30. Or what? Uh, I don't think it was. I, I don't recall. But I already sort of decided that was not the place. Okay? Okay. So... Uh, now, I mean, you basically had, um, uh, that group of 30 included places like, you know, the Scandinavian area, uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, the Caribbean, many... Which, many con which countries in the Caribbean? Well, pretty much they were all, you know, Haiti, Barbados yeah. and, Bar not, not Haiti, but uh, you got the Barbados. Dominican and, Republic is uh, terrible well, place, Well, that was not included, but I mean, no. many of the island, the small island countries. The okay. worst... Barbados, what else? Can you name one more? Uh, well, there's uh, Bermuda. I don't know if that's a country or not. To tell you the truth, it might be English. But the, there's uh, the, uh, let's see, the Antilles, something. I mean, there, okay, there's, okay, there's a whole anyway, bunch of... Anyway, so these were all very small places and, and but, actually... But they, in, they were independent... There, were, there are some independent countries there right. that uh, are democratic, more democratic than the United States. I've never heard of this. Yeah. Never. Well, I mean, it's too late because they basically have uh, gone downhill. Since then? Uh, since then, yeah. I mean, as a result of many things, but primarily the drug smuggling and the U.S. interference and the situation and on. Oh, God. The war on drugs. What a sad been, story. Yeah, has pretty much okay. compromised that. But so, um, I was a member of Amnesty International at this time, and I had been for a long time, actually. Good. And uh, I decided, well, if we're, you know, there's, there, there's no point of having... Democracy. I mean, democracy is not meaningful unless you have good human rights. You know. Okay. So without human rights, you can't really have democracy. So I. Well, uh, mostly people don't think of that. They just think about if you can just go to an election, that's it. You know? Yeah. And then then you got democracy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, most people don't know what democracy is. <laughs> it's it's fifty one percent. When you have a when you get fifty one percent in a country uh, voting, then you have a majority, and that's democracy. No. <laughs> that's not democracy. But a lot of people think that is absolutely not. okay. Yeah. Anyway, is an absolute necessity. Yeah. Yeah. So I went. I, I I looked up these thirty countries in my handbook from the Amnesty International, and I eliminated all the countries that were having problems. Uh, what, okay. Were there any left? Seventeen. Seventeen countries out of the originally thirty. 30. You had. Now you've got uh, seventeen. Right. Okay. And uh, then I located a book. Uh, put out by the International Labor Organization 
over Institute Study. ILO. Yeah. Okay. Studying the quality of working life, Institute Studying the Quality of Working Life around the world. Okay. Good studies, man. And then I, I uh, sent letters to all these institutes, okay, to see if they were interested in my research. Yeah. And I uh, got only one positive response. And that was from the business school in Denmark. Copenhagen Business School? In Aarhus. In Aarhus. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. So. They responded. Yeah. So they. And you they, responded to the responded. Yeah. So uh, they uh, arranged. Uh, well, well, I mean, uh, meanwhile, this took some time, you know, before it all worked out. So I had a. I had already left the University of, of Louisville. I had had a research position at Illinois, Northern Illinois University in DeKalb, uh, at a, set, a place called the Center for Biopolitical Research. Then I had another year in Alaska at Fairbanks, University of Alaska in Fairbanks, where I was teaching in the business administration department. Okay, where I taught oh, what's called organizational behavior and statistics and some database course and um, research design. And then uh, I went back to Stanford to uh, see what was going on there. And that's where I departed in 1984 to Marbus. Bye, Jeff. Yeah. Not both. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you flew directly to, did the plane land in Ottawa or did it land in Copenhagen and then you took a train or what? No, it landed in Aarhus. But I don't remember the, the in details. In Aarhus and then from there by train to Aarhus. Was it Aarhus or Aalborg? Aarhus. Business school. Aarhus. It was Aarhus Business School. Yeah. Okay. At that time Aarhus had its own business yeah. school. Oh, yeah, okay. I, was, I was in Aarhus and then I decided uh, to go to Sweden for uh, some research uh, that uh, I had gotten funded by the Swedish Cooperative Institute. Uh, and I was in um, Stockholm for one year, and then uh, I was at the University of <coughs> Gothenburg for the next year. <coughs> so you arranged something from the Aarhus Business School. You arranged with them that you're going to go to Sweden, check some things out, and come No, back. no, no. What? Uh, I just left. You just left? Okay. But well, hey, what was the purpose of, uh, when you got the response from the Aarhus uh, Business School, uh, what did they respond to? Did they say, well, come over here and get a job? As a no, uh, they, they invited me for a six-month visit. To do what? To uh, smoke cigars on their veranda? Well, I mean, they, I told them I was interested in using computer networks for democracy, okay, okay. promoting yeah. democracy. Yeah. And, and what, and, what uh, did you do work or lecture or what? I was a visitor, so I, I had no real responsibilities, you know. Uh, did you get money? Did you, did yeah, what? I mean, I was given, the, the money was supplied uh, by the USC uh, Telephone uh, and the Research Council, okay? So the, For was, the six it was months. an undefined, there's no description of your job, uh, what you're supposed to do, or well, this is completely free. Yeah, I mean, this is very typical for visiting academics. You know, you are basically expected yeah. to just continue doing your research and publishing papers and this kind of stuff, you know? Oh, why, oh I wish I had a job like that. <laughs> <laughs> so you did that for half a year? Yeah, and then they decided that uh, they wanted to keep me there, so they gave me a job, a wow. temporary position, um, for another half a year, uh, I think, and uh, it was after that I, I had arranged this other arranged. I had this other arrangement where I was at Stockholm University, but the money was coming from this Swedish Cooperative Institute and the Folksam Insurance Company. Uh, through, I think through the. I'm not sure exactly what the arrangement was, but I had a little project, you know, that uh, they were. But you completed the six months at, in Aarhus, and then you went off. No, no, I was uh, there. For six months, or I managed to visit, and then another temporary position for six months. Uh, so I was there a total of a year. Yeah. And then, then I was in Sweden for two years. What did you tell them when you, when you left? 
Oh, it's a very long story. Um, okay, 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 okay. And, uh, then you were cut out and uh, go to Sweden, yeah. And uh, I didn't, I didn't like it in Sweden, uh, so I. Came How back. long were you in Sweden? Two years. Two years. Yeah. Why did you stay there two years when you didn't like it? Well, I mean, it took me a long time to figure out that I didn't. Okay, like it. you're trying to understand the country, right? Right. It takes time. Yeah. I must you know, suffer. Well, <laughs> not suffer, but you know, learn Swedish and yeah, stuff like that. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Apply for jobs and research funding and see Why what happens. Why didn't you like Sweden after two years? Well, I didn't like the <clears throat> the regimentation and uh, academic regimentation or outside the university uh, social life regimentation. What is it? Well, the, 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 the I would say the whole society. You know, I mean, uh, there's there's this, and the, there's also this very much. Uh, domination by the uh, administrative people, you know, in Sweden. Uh, in, in administration of the university. Well, yeah, the well, or, or, or I mean, the administration or the, of the or the government. Well, the against the whole population. Yeah, I would say it's <clears throat> it's in general people in administrative positions talk to other people in administrative okay, positions. Okay, it's all society. Yeah, and and. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, I, I uh, and also the the job type arrangements I had had in Sweden. Hey, by this time, did you ever figure out if this also permeated sexual life in uh, regimented sexual Swedish <laughs> sex? <laughs> well, what? <laughs> no, I'm not, I don't. I wouldn't. Was it, what I'm trying to say is, was uh, did you? Was there anything, uh, did you feel that there was anything called uh, free sex in, uh, in uh, were they open and free sexual? Oh yeah, time? yeah, that's, that wasn't the It's problem. a different story, yeah. You know, okay. uh, I mean it's, uh, well I can go more into it. I mean it's, it's basically the same situation, it's, it's, it's very similar to what the situation is in Denmark, but worse. Okay. Okay? Like in Sweden, you have this law criminalizing customers of prostitutes. Okay. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and you have really a situation for women uh, in certain areas, which is worse than places where we think women are having a tough time. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, okay. You yeah. know, like the number of women who are physics professors in Sweden is below the number of other physics professors in Turkey. Or Cairo. <laughs> well, I don't know about Cairo. Because uh, I'm not, I, I okay. mean, I'm, no, I'm thinking okay. of a specific study Say that Turkey, was, right. yeah, okay. I was, I was yeah. thinking of a specific study that was done that compared several European countries uh, on, on okay. this yeah. question, all right. <clears throat> I know that there are, I'm, I'm not quite sure about exactly this uh, in, in Cairo, but uh, uh, there are uh, a number of, uh, 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 Arabic countries where uh, where there are more women sitting in political uh, positions or in professors or in uh, than there are in many uh, European countries. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean the. So uh, we're surprised all the time. Yeah. I mean the <laughs> the the countries with a Muslim uh, population <laughs> or background uh, mm -hmm. tend to have uh, separate roles for the sexes. Okay. So yeah, the. Yeah. So um, they are not expected, women are not expected to basically compete directly with men, mm -hmm. which is really impossible if they're going to have children anyway, yeah, you know? Yeah, right. So, uh, I mean, for instance, to, to be a professor in Sweden, you have to basically apply for a job when it opens up and you're competing with, as a woman, you're competing with men, okay? who are on the same level of career development as you are. Mm -hmm. But as a woman, you probably had a few years at home taking care of your kids, okay? Right. So you're basically a few years behind them. Right. So your chance right. of getting a job yeah. right. as a professor is extremely slim, right. okay? Yeah. Right. Even if there was yeah. no discrimination against women in these kind of things, mm -hmm. which there is, of course. Uh, but if you compare, if you look at the situation in Turkey, they just, realize that this competition, direct competition, was, is not suitable, okay? And so that to become a professor, you have to have like, you know, three papers in the top journals or, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And whenever you complete that, then you become a professor automatically. 
Okay, yeah. so uh, it's it's a much better system for women who want to be professors. Uh, <clears throat> I, I hope my wife doesn't hear this because maybe she'll take off to Turkey. I don't know. <laughs> okay, what's the next topic? Let's see. Well, I would say the the next topic would be social life in Denmark. Yes, let's take that. And its influence upon me. Right. Well, Danes believe they're very liberated sexually. But in fact, they lag behind even backward countries such as Zambia. In which way? Well, in what's called uh, socio-sexuality. Okay. okay. Uh, so with their women in these in a country like Zambia have much more freedom, okay, to organize their life sexually than women in Denmark. The women do, they organize it themselves. They, well, you know, I is, mean, isn't it, a, isn't it a patriarchal society? Well, <clears throat> I'm not familiar with the details of the situation in in uh, Zambia. Okay? okay, okay. I mean, I presume it is. Patriarchal, I mean, most of those places are. But the women are, you're saying the women are organizing their own lives. And well, they have more, sense. they have... Sexual they're, part of it. They're, they're more, they have more freedom to do that than Danish women. Or they actually do it more, let's put it that way. I mean, if you do examine them, you know, by survey methods, you find out that... Uh, uh, and, and, and can you be uh, more concrete? Well, it would, you know, when they're organizing their sexual lives, they organize the marriages. They organize no, no, no. Extra, I'm not, extra marital, well, the social sexuality is no. Well, I mean, that's not really what they look at. The social sexuality looks at more uh, the number of partners the person has had and, and this kind of stuff. And okay. and, uh, and they have uh, more partners before, after, in general, uh, while they're married. Uh, I I don't I, I don't think okay. the I don't think the the survey really looked at that. But uh, yeah. there are, I mean, it's just an example. There are many countries which we consider here in Denmark backward countries where women are better off in terms of this index, you know, social, what's called social okay. sexuality. So there are some studies that, that, that people can read uh, and, and get this information. I actually cite this work in my podcast, uh, called, which is called Monogamy and Evolutionary Perspective. And where can where can the viewers find this? Well, I uh, there's a link to it on my blog. Okay. Which uh, is available. Okay, you're, you're <clears throat> we will write the address of your blog on the video. Sure. I'll get it from you and put it on there. Sure. And, and other details. Yeah. Okay. So. So. So we uh, don't have. There. I mean, in Denmark, there's really one accepted way to live. And that's as as prescribed by the church. You have to find your one and only and live happily ever after. But the Danes okay. don't do that, you know. They're, well, that they're maybe half of the population is divorced. Well, this is a direct result of trying to do that. <laughs> okay. okay. Because because we know from from uh, studies that the uh, the initial obsession with a partner will blow over in a couple of years. And uh, then people either get divorced or they, or they live in a loveless marriage. And uh, uh, so only, I, be, I would say, about one out of ten people succeed in this uh, dream that uh, is sold to them by the Danish media system. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and also, the, you know, the deviations are really not permitted, even though they're ignored as long as... You know, they're not public. And it's, in other words, you can do whatever you want as long as you don't tell anybody. That's, that's, okay. that's the system. Okay. Is, okay. Does that also apply to being gay? Uh, or is that more accepted? Well, that's more accepted, but uh, there's still discrimination against people. You know. Definitely. If you're, out, if you're in Jutland, there's still a lot of discrimination. Yeah. Uh, so, but I mean, if, you, if somebody actually challenges the dominant model... Like for instance, the the uh, twin uh, schools, you know, right. which are, one, yeah. where yeah. they're sort of run communally. They are the schools where uh, the uh, Denmark uh, developed uh, one of the world's first uh, windmills, right? Right, and and uh, but they have more of a communal kind of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a bit puritanical, but uh, nevertheless, yes. 
But, I mean, they have been subject to government uh, prosecution and persecution. Which one? Yeah, really. Sure. Yeah. And, and that, this is what happens, I think. When... They, they even made a, what I would call, an unconst un unconstitutional law that's a law which, uh, which is, is, when you make a law which is specific to only to one group, that, in my opinion, is unconstitutional. Sure. Yeah, of course. I mean, a law, in a, a dem democratic law, has to be universal. Of course. Right? Of course. They, they've done the same thing with the uh, Hells Angels or Bandidos yeah. or whatever. Yeah, called, this is right? clearly at odds with democracy. Yeah, right. There's so no doubt about it. <laughs> you know. uh, what was your point with the twins? Uh, tw well, it's just an example board. of people who have tried to set up a different lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the result has been that the government has basically used all methods at their disposal to destroy the, the operation. And right now, I think the lawyer for the, the twin and, and uh, maybe some other people are basically hiding from an, yet another uh, lawsuit, you know, uh, after the head of, you know, the guy who started at MD, this guy MD, was dragged off from the U.S., thrown in jail for a year, and the judge concluded he hadn't done anything. You know, <laughs> that's right. That's so right. you know, having failed, what you know, in, Andy Peterson. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So having failed to destroy them by that, now they have a new persecution prosecution uh, in the works, and the lawyer for the for twin. Hey, is, 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 is there a simple uh, explanation for this motivation for why the uh, the government does like this? Is it just to uh, to crush any opposition? And opposition and alternative uh, forms of, uh, of people organizing themselves. Is that a threat to the government? Is that why they're cracking down on them so bad? Well, I think, I, I don't think the government sees that as a threat directly. So okay. why do it? What's the, what's the Well, it is, it is, it is uh, you know, uh, considered more to be a threat to morality, I would say, to the Christian principles that Denmark is based upon. This Danish <clears throat> church that nobody attends is right. actually uh, uh, has a power to, to do this or what? Well, I mean, the fact that nobody attends just shows that people don't need to be refueled. <laughs> <laughs> that the, the, the conditioning has worked so well that they don't even have to go to church. Anyway, the state and the church are one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, you had all this recent thing about how Muslims the, the, are so... The, the Prime Minister is actually a, a priest, uh, or, a <laughs> or a bishop or something. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, the, uh, the politicians in Denmark like to talk about how backward, you know, these Muslim countries are, and here we have a state church. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. You know? Amazing. How can Denmark be so much against the Iran? You know, that's also, it's, it's, a state, it's a state religion, a state church, in a way. They, have, they, they even have that in Denmark. Or not, not quite as much, maybe. Well, I think that the Iran question is not really related to Islamic religion. Republic. Yeah, no, that's not the, that's, I think, the, the agitation against Iran is uh, basically part of uh, maintaining high oil prices. That's the... Okay. Ultimate aim for that. So it is big. It is big oil companies promoting war talk in the Middle East so that they can make big profits. That's, I think, the so, actual so, so explanation. I, so too many people can drive around in their cars. No. What? That that. So so some elite can make a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not only make money, but also basically dominate. This guy Max Kaiser from Russia yeah. Today and yeah. uh, Press TV, yeah. he says that uh, he's always talking about when, when when most of us talk about the one percent against the ninety nine percent. Yeah, that he talks about the the one percent, the the ten percent of the one percent. Oh, that's right. It's, it's probably more like the one percent of the one percent. Yeah, probably. <laughs> okay, very few. Very few. Hey, one of our friends that we just met at the beach today said that. Uh, uh, even this, that there are, there, are, there are only three families ruling the world. 
with three families which have all of the or the decisive economic power to rule the world. Wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> I, it surprises me. I get shocked every time I hear these horrible. I mean the. Horrible. I mean I mean the world is. Uh, I mean I think if you take the Rockefeller family, yeah. that would be the leader, the leading. Even today. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the company with the biggest profits, okay, in, is ExxonMobil, okay? Okay. It's about 40 billion, I think a quarter. I'm not sure that figure is for a quarter or for a year, but I think it's a quarter. So the greatest profits, okay, are flowing into the owners of ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil is Rockefeller's Standard Oil after it's been through a few name changes, okay? Mm -hmm. Hey, if you take Wall Street, you take the banks, and you take the uh, Exxon, uh, what do you call those, the international... Uh, well, the national corporations. Corporations. Yeah. Uh, are, are they one and the same? Or can you make a hierarchy of the banks on top, and then, or the Exxon on top, uh, and, and then the banks, and then the Wall Street is uh, the bottom of the here, uh, pyramid? Well, I mean, they're, no, or, they're real. I mean, or are they just intermingled, or what? They're certainly intermingled. I mean, they, I mean, there are different mechanisms of control. There's not. There's not. You, you can't. 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 Can't you perceive them as one more powerful than the other? As a no, no, no. There are the. You can't do that. No, no. They're they're the. I mean the, the oil companies use Wall Street. Wall Street uses the oil companies. I mean, you know. I mean, they're they're just different aspects of the different faces of the ruling elite. Okay. Uh, the multinational corporations, Wall Street, and what was the other thing? Uh, the banks. Well, the banks, yeah. Yeah, they're just they're just different aspects of the uh, of the ruling elite. I mean, these are basically shields behind which the super rich hide. Okay. And the super the super rich, they are maybe just three families sitting there in their home somewhere. <laughs> yes. And they got all this shit working for them. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, it, it didn't happen by accident. I mean, they've been paying, you know, economists to produce propaganda for them and governments to give them all kinds of tax loopholes. Hey, and, I've, I've, I've got uh, four um, more or less concrete uh, questions yeah. that, I, that I think are relevant, pertinent, maybe now. Uh, is it okay to ask you them now? Or okay, let me, let me just finish to, up. You want to do something else? Well, I mean, part of your previous question was uh, how, uh, what effect this has had. I mean, this, uh, what influence the Danish social life has had, okay? Yes, yes. And uh, yeah, I, would, I would say my, the main, one main thing at least is that uh, I've come to understand how education can lock up a person sexually even more effectively than physical confinement, which is common in certain countries that we look down upon. Uh, which is the same as saying maybe that uh, people in academia or students, uh, university students, have a much less sex life than uh, the working class. Well, the, no, well, well, people well, are the no, same. No, people I'm, are I'm, the same age. P people that do not go to no, the no, university, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking they have more sex than people who go to the university. Yeah, I don't know if that's a. I don't think that's really what I'm talking about here, though, because I'm th when I'm talking about education here, I'm thinking of early education. Even even before people get to formal education. Okay. 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 You're 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 comparing uh, education in in, in uh, I would say it's more social in, in, in the Western world it's, with uh, with life sexual I, I, life among the Amazons. Well, I yeah, I would call it socialization, not education. That's that would be clear. Socialization. Okay. Uh, How Western socialization uh, represses uh, sexuality. Yeah. Well. I mean, the, uh, I think in Denmark you see a very clean view of this because the, basically the, ins, the society is dominated by the state church. So that, you know, that model is pretty much ingrained. You know, I mean, there's not much of an alternative in Denmark. 
or at least it wasn't until very recently, you know, when we started to have uh, immigrants coming in on a, on a larger scale than previously. Okay, yeah, yeah. but and even that will not have an effect because this is what I'm. This is these kind of things or attitudes that are indoctrinated into people while while they're very small, you know, before they even go to school at all. Okay, yeah. so. A, the, I mean, a, a deeper understanding uh, shows that sexual freedom can be permitted, okay, while yeah. the ability to love is destroyed. Okay, right? okay, okay. That, there's a big difference there <clears throat> of how much uh, love you have in a swinger, sex swinger uh, culture uh, where people just go and uh, fuck each other in a club somewhere. Yeah, well, I mean, and, and, uh, and that can be a lot of fun, but maybe there isn't so much love in it. Well, the whole point is that there isn't. I mean, okay. I mean, people do not. People go to these kinds of clubs specifically to avoid any involvement. Okay. 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 Because you can't, you can't have love with no involvement. The uh, the what do you call that in English? The well, then we could have sex without love. Yeah, right. but not. Yeah. Okay. But by okay. swingers, that's the whole point of swinging. Okay, yeah. it's, sex, it's basically sex. sex. No love. It's no, yeah, no sex love. as entertainment. Entertainment, right? Yeah. Entertainment, right. sex, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I would say that in Denmark, there, um, you don't have to go to a swingers club to have sex entertainment. Okay, <laughs> that's sort of the norm. Let's put yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, it, it is accepted that sex is a physiological function. Can't mm -hmm. avoid it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, system is set up so that love is destroyed. Okay? And my theory about why this has happened, okay, mm -hmm. is that when the transition was made from, from Catholicism uh, to Protestantism, yeah, okay, yeah. You, you eliminate this uh, mediator between you and God. Okay, in the Catholic system, the, the priest tells you what God is saying. Right. In the Protestant system, you talk to God yourself. Okay. okay? Now, if you're going to talk to God yourself and it's going to really be good, that has to be your closest relationship, right? Right. right. Okay, now, if you fall in love with a member of the opposite sex, or even of the same sex, and it's good, that could be an impediment to your good relationship with God. So it's better that you have a shit relationship with people you have sex with and maintain your good relationship with God to save your eternal soul. <laughs> I, 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 I'll think about that one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I haven't done any studies on this, okay? okay? But okay. I mean, this... So this is just a hypothesis okay. that somebody might want to test, okay? Yeah. Uh, and I presume there would be a way of testing this, but I haven't really thought about it. But that's my current we'll, theory. We'll, we'll both think about it. The viewers will think about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So part of part of this though is 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 uh, equality feminism. Okay. Quality feminism. E equality feminism. In other words, there's two types of femi feminism. One is what's called equality feminism, where the idea is equal rights for women. Right. And the other is difference feminism. Okay, which is, what? Which is uh, different roles for men and women in society. Okay, mm -hmm. so for instance, the feminists in India say equal rights with men. Uh, we would never accept such a low standard. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 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 that's good. Okay, uh, and similarly, in the Muslim countries, you have this separate role for women. You know. So, the system of equality feminism in Denmark basically turns women into men because women can do everything a man can do, but they have to act just like a man. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, Very interesting. And this has physical impacts. It has women tend to have uh, waists that are not that slim. Okay. And this is associated with higher cancer rates. Turns out. Okay, higher cancer rates. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the effect of equality feminism. And then the other big influence in Danish society is uh, Guyanism. 
Okay. Gaia. What's Gaianism? Gaianism is the Gaianism. To guide, guide somebody. No, no, no. Gaianism. G I A N. Ism. Gaianism is the belief that the earth is a living system. Okay? In other words, it's. I've heard of the Gaia theory. That's Gaia theory. Then? Yeah. Yeah. The, the Gaia theory says. And, and, and human civilization is supposed to be a cancer on the corpus of the earth. Right. In the, that's more, one of the more extreme views, yes, that has been put forward yes. uh, uh, by people mm -hmm. at conferences and so on. Yeah. So, so I would say that this uh, Gaianism, or you could call it ecologyism, you know. Or, I heard a criticism of that uh, a biologist working at the Danish zoological, uh, at the zoo, yeah. uh, said that uh, it was uh, not science but morality. Is yeah. that your opinion? Yeah, it is basically a replacement a modern, uh, uh, is it a more acceptable religious belief than a belief in God? The Gaia theory. The Gaia theory, yeah. Okay. This is, I would say, the I, leading... I, I was very, I, I thought it was a very exciting theory. I, I, I used it for a while everywhere <laughs> to hit people on the head. Yeah, well, I'm, I am actually working on a book on global warming in which I analyze how this came about, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but... Uh, one of the, I had a consulting job with the, what at that time was called the Research Center on Forest and Landscape, okay? Mm -hmm. And one of the findings from that study showed that the media system in Denmark is constantly promoting uh, pessimism about the environment, okay? Okay. Uh, that could be constructive, but it might be also destructive. No, it is destructive. Okay. I mean, because you you are well, basically thinking. Is, is, is it possible to continually uh, to to say the truth all the time and that be destructive? Is that what you're trying to tell me? But what they're saying is not the truth. That's the point. They're they're they're, say, they're talking about the the threat to the environment, aren't they? Yeah. Okay. You but the environment think. actually <laughs> is not threatened as much as people worry about. Okay. Okay. Are you, are you, a, are you a, a, an adherent to this guy called Lombo? No. <laughs> no, because I, I Lombor. think... Lombor. Lombor is, is actually... He's an anti-climate change advocate. Yes. No, he isn't. He actually accepts the idea that there is climate... Oh, but it's not man-made. No, he accepts that too. Oh, God. Okay. But he says, well... <laughs> Even if we accept that, that there is going to be this three degree temperature rise within a hundred years, okay? Instead of spending a lot of money now on windmills and all this kind of stuff, what we should do is do research. Because of the results of research will allow us to more effectively cope with this climate problem. Okay. okay? You, you believe all that? What? Uh, are you an ad adherent of his um, model for... Uh... Uh, solving the uh, or, or the best way to act uh, to respond to climate change? Well, I would be if I believed that there was a problem. <laughs> you don't think there's a problem? There's no evidence of it whatsoever. Oh no. my god. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, you surprised me. Go ahead, continue. <laughs> no, my, uh, I mean, the, I, uh, Basically, my, my view on this is, uh, be, was, is been put forward by an economist at UCLA, okay? okay. Good. And uh, his analysis is that since the death of God in the West, okay? Since uh, Friedrich Nietzsche. Well, not God. Nietzsche, but I mean, more important figures are Copernicus that kicked us out of the center of the universe, okay? And, and then uh, Darwin that said, hey, you know, you're not special beings, you're just smart apes. And then Freud who said, well, you think you know what you're doing, but really you don't. <laughs> well, your real reasons are okay. due to your unconscious okay. urges, right. okay? Mm -hmm. So these three impacts have undermined the traditional religious beliefs of the West. I mean, if somebody goes down to the museum, they see a dinosaur from hundreds of millions of years ago, it's hard for them to believe the earth was created in seven days, 5,000 years ago after that, right? Okay, okay. So this is what's called the death of God. 
But they still believe the shit in the states. Yeah. You know, half the people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, the, but anyway, the uh, there is a, a theory, uh, or a recent theory of uh, existentialism, okay, a modern version of existentialism that has been developed in the U.S., uh, which basically says that you know, uh, people need to have some kind of myths to believe to give them meaning in life. You know, yeah, so they, a lot so of they, do. Yes. so yes. they, yes. not not a lot of people. Says they're, they're everybody. saying everybody, everybody, everybody. Okay. yeah, because without a myth, okay, about uh, you know your role in life and what's good and all. Does this. that mean there is no truth that could replace this myth? Well, no, that's not what just, it means. We just it, have to believe in something. Maybe you can believe in some truth and not just in some myth. Right, but the, the point is, though, that you need to have this myth, whatever it is, even if it's a true one. Okay, okay. okay. No, you need something. You need something because otherwise you, have, you face your eventual annihilation without any psychological protection. And, okay, and most people... Well, it gives you a drive. That's the point. The That's wish, the point. The wish, the drive to survive. The fear of death creates indirectly a drive because you have, you have two things. You have, number one, your ability to look into the future, see that in a thousand years you're not going to be there. Okay? I, my drive could, if I were a believer, I could have a drive that said, I want to meet St. Peter and I want to pass the test. Up there. Yeah. Well, that's one myth. That, and that's the myth that has been right. dominant in... But that, in, that would not be a death drive. That would be not... Uh, not that would be no, a no, death, we're not talking... That would be a death wish. No, no, no. We're not talking about a death wish or a death drive. Okay. The, the, what we're talking about is a cognitive conflict. And okay. that cognitive conflict is between two things. Number one, your survival instinct. You want to survive. And number two you know you cannot survive because you can see yourself in the future, okay? So this generates a motive yeah. and that motive creates the myth, okay? okay? So the, the fear of death is sort of the fuel that drives the cultural system, the development of the cultural system, all right? So anyway, this, this uh, guy, this economist at uh, UCLA, he went back to India and he gave a talk about uh, this climate problem. Mm -hmm. All right, and he said, "Well, since the death of God in the West, there has been a series of secular religions." Okay. In other words, a, a religion that yeah. claims to be science. That's a new age. What's called a new age religion. All right. And Scientology. Yeah. 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 And uh, he said the first of these secular religions was the Enlightenment, okay? Because what these New Age religions do is basically they retell the biblical story of the city on the hill, St. Augustine's city on the hill, okay? You know, where people fall into sin, then some are saved and the others too bad, right? So the Enlightenment was salvation, okay? That was the first salvation. Secular salvation. Yeah. And then the next one was Marxism. Okay. Or Freudianism. Yeah. Okay, or both of those he considers to be secular yeah. religions. And the latest one, he says, is this belief in global warming. Okay? Because that is a great way of generating meaning. I mean, just what could be more but, important but, than... But, why, but the, the others were uh, uh, religion, secular or not, uh, of hope. Uh, climate change is not hope, but death. Oh, it's sure. actually death. No, no, Climate change no. is not hope. No, 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 no. It, it, is, it not. is the end of the world. Climate uh, change. That that's is. why it is meaningful. What could be more important than saving the world? Okay, and if you're working to save the world... Well, that's a very good thing for you to do, isn't it? Yeah. So that's how it works. Yeah. Okay? So, um, basically, uh, I looked at this guy's theory, you know, and I said, well, this guy's an economist. What does he know? 
He's a what? An economist. Yeah, yeah. No, okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, he's just making this stuff up. Right. Working uh, for a bank. <laughs> <laughs> So I started to investigate whether so this could be correct from a psychological standpoint. Mm. And it turns out there's real good data to, that says it is correct. Okay. So, but anyway, uh, this belief is certainly the leading religion in Denmark now, right now. Okay. To save the world. To save the world from global warming, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think it's my religion. Well, it is the religion of most people in Denmark, yeah. Okay. What's your religion? Well, I try. I would say my religion, and it would be cosmism. Cosmism, cosmic cosmism. Yeah, because you see the the uh, yeah. the the uh, the idea of global warming. Okay, is placing the Earth in the center of the universe from a psychological standpoint. Okay. Hmm. It's a bit far out, but okay. Well, I mean, you know, people talk about how we need another planet because we're using up all the resources, right? The, I think the problem is that not enough people believe that we should, that we should, that we, that, that, that I think there's an elite that wants to move to another planet, or uh, if not another planet, then at least uh, make this world to a to kind of different planet, a science fiction fascist dictatorship in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a new, I mean, let, it, let all the plants in the world die, let all, let, all, let all the animals in the world die and disappear from the face of the earth, and uh, let uh, biotechnology uh, save, save uh, the, 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 the world or, uh, from disappearing by creating a, what I would call a science fiction fascist society where uh, all you need is uh, uh, a certain amount of vegetation and you need uh, uh, only uh, the bacteria and the biotechnology today, the bio biologists, all of the biologists today uh, tell me that uh, it's quite possible today to uh, just have bacteria and a certain amount of vegetation and we can, uh, we can uh, have all the food and the proteins and everything we need. We don't need all of these animals and fish, let them disappear from the face, we don't care. So everything is in, uh, to technology, everything is here to uh, kill everybody you don't like, all the animals, let the industry just move on out, we don't give a damn, uh, and, and then these fascists will just take over the world. <laughs> that's my, that's my, uh, that's my uh, uh, what do you call it, Skype scenario. scenario. My, yeah, the uh, shock, shock, nightmare, nightmare vision, nightmare vision. Yeah, yeah something like that. Yeah. Um, and, well, and, and I think the uh, people who run uh, Exxon and the, uh, these three families, uh, they would have nothing against this because they could just sit there in their uh, ivory towers and uh, run the whole world or whatever is left. Well, this, this. They don't give a damn. Long yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, problem, you see, so you're... they have to do nothing, nothing at all. Yeah. To uh, to to save the. Plants and the animals yeah, today. Yeah. Well, that's a political analysis. Okay. However. However, what? It's not a political problem. Okay. I want to hear why this is not a why is climate change not a problem? This is your thesis. Well, it's not a problem because it's not happening. I mean, look, look, just look at the language. Climate change. Right. The climate is always changing. It has always changed. Yeah, it, it will it, always continue to change. It is implicit that people mean for the worse that, uh, that when I uh, go out on the street, I am choking on uh, carbon dioxide. You and cannot choke on carbon dioxide. I, you exhale carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon okay. dioxide is what plants need to grow. Yeah, but I know the whole that, idea that well, what, do, what do you call that stuff that comes out of the exhaust pipes of the automobiles? Well, many things come out of exhaust right. pipes. That stuff that comes out there, and also from these so-called mopeds that uh, on that pass me by when I'm on a bicycle uh, path, they uh, they they pass me by, and I am very very I'm irritated. If I had a gun, I would shoot the guy in the back, or if I had a rotten egg, I'd throw it at him. Yeah, but that's right. not. That, that is not a, a, an intelligent way to respond. That is not... So, instead of responding like that, 
I, I politically uh, want uh, these. I want these mopeds to get off these bicycle paths and uh, do their driving somewhere. I want them to get away from my inhaling these fumes that they distribute. Yeah, but I mean, you're, that, and that is not uh, related to the global warming. You know, this is it, it, a it, local problem. Okay. It, it, to me, I'm not a scientist. I uh, I believe in until uh, until you have explained it otherwise to me. Yeah. That uh, this is part of the problem with uh, of, uh, uh, climate change, for the worse. The 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 industries, the, uh, the, the all the, the the pollution of the planet. This is part of the pollution of the planet, and that's a problem. Yeah, but globally and for me personally. Well, uh, that's, that's you I cannot. Talk, it is incorrect to talk about carbon dioxide as a pollutant. Okay, but does it, uh, that doesn't have it. <laughs> okay, say something. Say something more about that. Carbon dioxide is what plants need. Yeah, I know they need it. I don't need it. I, I, I'm choked okay. to death on it. And I'm, uh, I, it you don't choke to death on it. You exhale it. I should exhale it. You do exhale it. Okay. Uh, the stuff that comes out of these exhaust pipes. Uh, that bothers me. I got well, to get that, rid of that. That is. It's not, it's not, that's not carbon dioxide, huh? No. What's it called? Well, the thing, these are is things... It, there comes no carbon dioxide out of an exhaust pipe of an automobile? Well, you, that would not affect you in any way, because that's normal constituent of the atmosphere. The plants need it, but I don't need it. You need to exhale it. But, when, but, I, but I, yes, I need to exhale it when it's there, but why am no, I... No, 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 you, you need to exhale it because that is produced by your body when you... Uh, are you using the fuel that you eat? Okay, you convert oxygen, okay, mm -hmm. into carbon dioxide. That's the way you live. All right, and plants live I by. I inhale. I inhale oxygen right. and exhale uh, carbon dioxide. Right. Okay. And the plants inhale the carbon dioxide right, and right. exhale oxygen. But and but if but if I have no uh, oxygen near me. And there's only carbon dioxide. Then I'm forced to inhale what I should be exhaling, and that is not good for my body. Yeah, but the and that is that is the what's carbon happening. dioxide is a trace gas. There, you, you will not have that situation you're talking about. Hey, unless somebody how, locks you in. in how a, is it? It's very. You, you you see a lot of movies on the television yeah. about people committing suicide. They get inside their car. They make sure the exhaust pipes uh, fumes go into the car, and then they die, yeah, they die in there. That's carbon it's, monoxide. That's something else. Actually, I should have said carbon monoxide all along. Yeah, but I mean, the, what, the, what you, the problems you uh, get from these exhaust pipes is the, due to the fact that the fuel is not burned completely. That's what it is. Carbon monoxide is, is not unburned. It's, it's unburned fuel. It's unburned fuel. And that is what is uh, uh, bad for you. Well, you wouldn't smell that. You cannot smell carbon monoxide. So, okay, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's, but it it's is, deadly. It is deadly, yes, <laughs> okay. but it is also unburned because you can burn. Hey, is it also painless? Because if I decide it is painless, to, yes, that means it's a good way to die. It is. That's why people use ah, it. But I can't do. But this, this, the the fumes from a car to die that way, uh, is that painless? Yeah, I mean, how how come that I often sit in a bus that is leaking the fumes? They they get into the into the uh, uh, the bus somehow. Uh, and, and I feel like I'm choking to death on it. That's the unburned fuel. Okay. Well, I'm uh, very happy. And, and, and there's also, well, you know, uh, what are called oxides of nitrogen and, you know, okay. all these basically okay. things that are okay. not really been totally burned. That's why these are kind of I'm very happy getting clarity on this. Yeah. It's very nice. <laughs> Thank you. So, I mean, the, I mean the, the reason you cannot treat this as a political problem, okay? Okay, what's that? Is because the oil companies are also supporting people who are promoting global warming. Like if you remember what was called Climate Gate, mm, where somebody yeah. released the big load of emails from the Climate Research Center in, in the UK. Yeah. Well, one of the things that people were talking about in those emails is how they're going to get Shell to give them money. All right? So if the oil companies are promoting or trying to defeat this view of global warming, they wouldn't be giving the money to people who are promoting global warming, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm saying it is a religious problem, okay. not a political problem. Okay. Okay. okay great. 
you want to say any more on this? Well, that sort of pretty much beat the question of Guyanism to death, okay? Right. I mean, I can say a lot more about it, but I mean, that's not the topic, right? That's not the topic. Okay. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, so your next question. Okay, well, hey, we, 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 we've covered the bit on uh, your influence of Danish social life and uh, or, or American social life. I don't know if we finished it on Danish, you know, the influence on you on Danish social life. Did we get into that? I think so, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, I think I'd like to uh, ask you some four questions before we hit that with uh, yeah, okay. Craig and Hertog. Um Let me just suggest it and, uh, and then uh, maybe, maybe we'll not do it. I want to hear what you... Sure. you could we go into a discussion now? Uh, I'll just... About uh, four, quest four things I'd like you to uh, give me your comments on. Yeah. And the one, one thing is uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks yeah. with respect to social networking and developing democratic uh, processes. Yeah. That's the one thing. The second thing is, um, have you ever heard of uh, Bitcoin and the future of Bitcoin? Yeah. Okay. What, if, what is, if anything, significant about Bitcoin and the future of Bitcoins with respect to social networking and developing democratic processes? Number two. Number three, what do you think about the Pirate Party? And, and maybe even the networking and developing democratic processes. The fourth thing is uh, um, an Icelandic court uh, convicts PayPal, has convicted PayPal and MasterCards to pay daily fines until they accept monetary transactions to and from WikiLeaks. Have you heard of that? I haven't heard of that, no. Okay. Uh, a court, yeah. Anyway, they, they, and they have a good spokesperson for WikiLeaks on Iceland. And uh, there's a close... Uh, he, uh, uh, Julian San has been in Iceland many times. And uh, they've got, he's got the uh, got majority of the governments. Yeah, we, okay, let's, well, what's the first question? I'll should, we, should we take the four? Can you give a comment on all four? Things? Yeah, give me the first one. Okay, uh, David uh, Stardowski. Uh, I'd, I'd appreciate it very much, and maybe some of our viewers would also appreciate it, if you could just uh, comment on, uh, on uh, uh, four, four topics here. The first one is, uh, what is, if anything, significant about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks with respect to social networking and developing democrat democratic processes, can you can you comment on that? Well, I don't. I don't think that uh, there's really any direct relationship. I mean, the uh, WikiLeaks is uh, basically a a part of the press, uh, and its publications uh, are crucial if people are going to have the knowledge they need to be politically active. And you wouldn't call that uh, necessary influence or whenever necessary. Um, relating necessarily to democratic processes? If, well, if, I mean, if, if, if it's vital for democratic it is vital. processes. Yeah, but I mean, it so, is, uh, it is uh, not uh, normally, cons the information distribution function, okay, is not normally considered to be an element of the democratic process. I mean, it is essential. Okay, but it is normally considered to be outside of the political system, right? I mean, it is the fourth... It's a prerequisite for potential democ democratic... Yeah, but there are, there are many other prerequisites. Education okay. and, you know, all, I, there are I, many I, prerequisites for... Education is knowledge. WikiLeaks, what they have done is related to knowledge. It yeah. has something to do with knowledge. Yeah. And uh, the whole world has talked about WikiLeaks and the Arab uprisings, uh, uh, yeah. uh, Spring and, and all of these things that are going on. And even even the Julian Assange's, uh, what do you call it? Uh, um, the reason that Ecuador uh, supports Julian Assange as much as it does yeah. has not even come out to the public uh, on uh, in, in 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 Danish or American European media. Uh, the only reason I know it is because the president Correra. Uh, was in a in, in Julian Assange on Russia Today had yeah he still has this series of, this show where uh, where <clears throat> where he says that uh, uh, Ecuador is deeply indebted to WikiLeaks for releasing a lot of leaks that uncovered uh, um, is especially American espionage and corruption and all kind of illegal activities in Ecuador yeah. 
<laughs> so they they they, <laughs> uh, they they want a kind of good payback <laughs> uh, to, and and try to help him out. This has not been meant, even in the, uh, even on the uh, back page of uh, information. There was uh, a whole uh, uh, a, 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 what do you call it a leader yeah. in, in a leading article editorial a, editorial yeah. uh, where they had all kinds of uh, uh, guessings and, 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 and postulates on why Ecuador was uh, uh, was supporting Assange and essentially all, all of all of the reasons were they had something to do they they just had a good had now have an opportunity to become popular. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, unfortunately, the the main the press in in Denmark is not very and you, you should think information uh, was a bit uh, in tune. You would, uh, yeah, you would but, think but, so. Uh, but uh, uh, even no. information has gotten even more reactionary the last ten years. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, well, I mean, and, even even ten years ago, they were really okay. Well, if we uh, go back to, uh, <laughs> I mean, you got to go the, the hippie you, movement, maybe sixty eight. Maybe, but was, I mean, it was pretty uh, good then. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, this is... Uh, but anyway, uh, so that's, that's uh, you have no more comment uh, uh, to... Uh, well, I mean, to me. I mean, one of the major reasons why Assange is being given asylum is because the, the uh, Ecuadorian government does not believe he can get a fair trial in the United States. And he won't. And he won't. No, I mean, the treatment <laughs> yeah. of, of uh, Bradley Manning shows what happens to people. Exactly. You know, exactly. and and uh, you know, this is basically torture. And, and not not only that, but think of all of the uh, uh, notorities, uh, no, uh, the uh, uh, public figures, senators, and every senators that have openly declared that the guy should be shot. Right. You know. Yeah, I mean, it, it is absolutely <laughs> well, well, clear that he would uh, not be. It would be impossible for him to get a fair trial. Right. Uh, even if he had, I mean, if he had actually done anything. I mean, you know, the point is he hasn't actually done anything, so... Uh, and uh, yeah. what about, well, what's your opinion of Sweden? Would they send him off to America? Sure. And uh, why would they do that, in your opinion? Well, because uh, they have, over the entire Cold War period, been doing things to endear themselves to the United States. And they would continue to do it now. I mean, you know, uh, uh, it is... A regimented society, and uh, you know, uh, basically, you do as you're told, and and uh, Julian is not doing as he's told. There, there's you know? in the White House. Uh, I think it was the previous White House. Uh, there was this guy called Karl Rove. Yeah. Uh, I think it was he. It was him or somebody else, but I think it was him that is said to have uh, special relations with, with uh, connections, personal and and political connections with. Uh, uh, powerful people in Sweden. Uh, it wouldn't surprise uh, me. Uh, <laughs> you know. And he, uh, Karl Rove was actually, I think he was even, uh, in die, he was indicted and I think he was in convicted too of some criminal offenses. But now he has been rehabilitated and is coming back into politics. Well, he never left politics. Uh, he, he evidently has a, the power to... Uh, uh, I mean, he was... <laughs> no, I mean, the U.S. is not... Is not prosecuting criminals. That the you're, you're in complete alignment with uh, Max Kaiser. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, I don't think I don't think Max Kaiser is a reliable source. Okay, uh, but he has all of our, all these guests in his studios. Are they unreliable? Well, I don't watch him enough to know. I okay, mean, okay. So, I mean, but the uh, the situation in the U.S. now is that people in the White House can engage in criminal activity and nobody says anything. I mean, you know. Well, that's exactly what Max Geiger says. But okay, leave it. <laughs> hey, uh, the other question is, uh, what is, if anything, significant about Bitcoins? Bitcoins uh, and the future of Bitcoins with respect to social networking and developing democratic processes. And Bitcoins, uh, just for the viewers, uh, is a uh, the world's first... Uh, a decentralized uh, digi digital uh, uh, currency. Currency, exactly. So, do you have anything to say? Is there anything you can say about uh, what significance this might have on uh, democratic processes and networks? I don't. I don't think it's uh, well. There's anything directly. Again, not, not directly. I mean, but, uh, but will it have any influence? It can can uh, can uh, developing democratic processes or? 
I, I, for, I, I, for, uh, uh, political movements? Can they use this? Well, I mean, and the people's we, movements of the world use bitcoins uh, to their advantage. Well, I mean, if if people are very worried about uh, you know somebody finding out that they've given money to a certain source, then bitcoins could be uh, useful. But uh, that's it. Uh, I mean, so you know. One 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 of uh, Max Kaiser's uh, uh, postulates is that uh, uh, the one of the main ones is that the. Uh, the banks are notor notorious uh, thieves. Of course, uh, yeah. they steal left and right out of people's uh, savings uh, in in every way imaginable. Oh, that's, uh, that's nothing new. So to distance yourself from the banks can only be good. Get an alternative. Get something that is totally independent of the banks, and that's Bitcoin. No, what? Because Bitcoin's is not correctly structured from an economic standpoint. Say some more. Well. I mean, you know, there are certain features of a currency that are necessary if you're going to be able to use it and promote economic activity. To buy okay. and sell. You don't think that bitcoins can be used to buy and sell? It can be used to buy and sell, but... The, but well, isn't that the basis of economics? No. Okay. What is? The basis of economics is a, it is a mechanism for transmitting information between producers and consumers. This could be used as a supplement to that. Uh, uh, yeah, it could be used as a supplement. But I mean, the the problem with Bitcoin, from an economic standpoint, is it doesn't it doesn't in any way uh, uh, what do you call undermine economic growth, does it? Yes, it would. If it became widely used, it would undermine economic growth. If what? If it became widely used, it would undermine economic growth. How? Well, there's a fixed number of bitcoins. Right. Okay. But the, generally, in. Uh, that's not a good way to set up a currency. But uh, it can be nevertheless, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I don't know if I understand it uh, properly, but anyway, there's, there's a set definite, that, that, that should prevent inflation and manipulation with the currency because that's, that's the reason for having a set amount. Yeah, but, uh, but, but anyway, you, it, uh, it can be, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, divided. A Bitcoin can be divided inf infinitely uh, in, in smaller and smaller pieces, and this this should this should this should nevertheless make it possible to possess Bitcoins, even if it's yeah. But I mean, in, having a fixed amount of currency yes. generally is a bad idea from an economic standpoint. It, it is if you're a banker no. who wants to no. manipulate no. with the... No, uh, no. Explain yourself. I mean, that's true Why? too, but it is, it is also just a bad idea from Why? an economic standpoint. Uh, okay? you, you've, got to, you've got to explain it or give me a good argument for that or explain how this is... You, I well, can, I can't just make a statement. I mean, myself. I am not an economist, so I can't really go into the chapter and verse. Okay, okay, but I mean, I have one of... You know, there are people in the U.S. now who say the U.S. has got to go back on the gold standard. Right. And, and that would also mean a fixed amount of something that cannot be it manipulated. Is, it, to my opinion, it is the same principle governing gold and bitcoins. That's right. So you and, and I agree on that. Yeah. But both of those principles are not good for, for the economy. So you think that uh, when uh, Nixon and later Ronald Reagan uh, went uh, dropped the gold standard, that was good for the economy? That's well, your, that's, your that's a little, that's really involving some other things, so you can't really say that. But if you look at what a currency is supposed to do, mm -hmm. yeah. okay, having a fixed amount of it doesn't give you the leeway you need to actually promote employment growth and all those other good things, okay? Uh, the bankers and the power elite of today are very happy about uh, dropping the gold standard. They, yeah, they, they, it, it gives the bankers, they give these people enormous power. Well, they can, they can, they can manipulate all kind of economic. Yeah, but I mean, uh, you could uh, and, just. And they would not be able to do it if you had gold and bitcoins. Yeah, but they would also not be able to do it if the government took the power, of creating currency then, away from them. Yes, but the, the problem is that uh, <laughs> that um, the the bankers and the people with the, the economic power they have bought. 
they they own the politicians, especially in the United yeah, States. Yeah, yeah, but in I mean, this States. is totally different question. The, what we're talking about now is a theoretical question about how, what function, how does a currency promote the transactions that are needed in the economy, right? Now, if you have a fixed amount of currency, okay, what does that mean? You tell me. That means that you have a basically a deflation, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. If you have, you're, you're, if you, uh, if you are, maybe, I don't know if you have a deflation. You, you, you have you, a deflation. You are able to prevent inflation. No, you have a deflation. Okay. Because new things are being produced all the time. Okay. So. If yeah. new things are being produced and new money is not being produced, then you have a deflation because that, but, but that Bitcoin... Hey, hey, hey the, problem, the problem today is that uh, uh, there are no... The new things are not being produced. New things are being produced. We are... The whole economic tendency now is to produce less and less. No. Because... No. <laughs> No, I mean, you, you have a camera the G, there. What is that, that camera? Hey, Look at hey, that camera. Hey, hey, the, the GDP uh, um, uh, gross domestic uh, uh, growth uh, is slowing down and slowing down, and there's no, uh, uh, nothing in the future that uh, one can say is pointing in the direction that this will change. Well, you know, there are some very rich people in the U.S. who have decided they're going to send a spaceship off to grab an asteroid that comes nearby the Earth. They will do anything to promote the uh, people to investing in their uh, pet projects. Whatever. <laughs> but the point is uh, that if, if they succeed mm -hmm. in capturing one of these asteroids, okay, yeah. and extracting all of the valuable minerals, yeah. gold, gold, silver, platinum, and so on, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. the wealth represented by those minerals would be greater than the wealth that has been produced on this planet in its entire history. You know what I can imagine? If that happened, uh, the price of gold would diminish to nothing and bitcoins would be the most valuable thing ever in the universe. There are many possibilities <laughs> of, of what could happen, but the, the, the point is okay. that there are new things and if there's not new money, okay, mm then you have deflation. Deflation is basically injecting, you know, poison into the economy. People, okay. because people don't want to spend their money because they don't want to be worth more tomorrow. Economic activity basically stops. Okay. 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 And that's, I, what, that's why it's... So, so I won't be able to sell you any bitcoins. Well, I mean, it's great if you, you know, you want to do something tomorrow, you get it today and do it, you know, you buy the bitcoins today and sell them tomorrow. That no, that's fine, but you know, it, that's you can, not the what you can account. also use it as a, as a, I mean, a, a, as a, sa a savings account. Money has at least no. That's a totally different thing. Money has many different functions. Okay, one of them is to exchange, buy and sell. One is to basically hold value, and there are about a dozen different functions of money. Okay, okay, and some of them are in contradiction to others. Okay, okay, because economists normally like to have a little bit of inflation to encourage people to spend their money. But if if they if there's inflation, then the money loses its value. So it cannot be you cannot store wealth that way. Okay. Okay. So the whole idea that we can solve all our problems by some economic mumbo jumbo, bitcoins or any other thing is total nonsense. But uh, you can you just said you can use it for some things. You can use it for transactions. Right. Anonymous right. transactions, but that's that's pretty uh, much did, it. Okay, you said yes to that, but did you say no or yes to? You can use it as a, a savings savings account instead of putting a savings account and putting a Danish corner euros. Well, in the bank, I, I you mean, can, you, uh, can, you can uh, buy I bitcoins mean, and you and you can tra you can trade them on the on the uh, what do you call well, it? stock I, stock exchange. I mean, the that's where you uh, buy the nowadays, stability the, the stability of the bitcoin is been very weak. Did you hear the lecture at uh, CIPOS, uh, the uh, in Denmark? Okay, yeah. okay. No, I mean the uh, bitcoins have gone up and down very dramatically over a very short period of time. So uh, that even happens with gold. Well, yeah. not because really. Because the, really. the gold prices are manipulated by by banks and others. Well, yeah, but I mean the the. Uh, 
the Bitcoin is uh, basically, you know, not going to solve these kind of problems that you're talking about. Okay. I mean, you can, you base. I mean, all of economics is basically a religion. Okay. Right. It's a secular. Yes, yeah, a secular religion. It's a very, it's a very popular religion. Secular myth. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and so, you know, okay. any kind of changes to the economy that you make will not solve the fundamental problems. Okay. Hey, I think we got your opinion about bitcoins. Yeah. Hey, what do you think about the pirate party? Well, I think it's a great idea. Uh, is that similar to when somebody asked uh, uh, Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? He said it was a great idea. Uh, do you, <laughs> uh, you think it's a <laughs> the pirate party is a great idea? Well, I think because it isn't. Uh, it, it isn't democratic now, or, or, or is it? Is it? Is it? Is can it? Does it represent de de developing democratic processes? Well, it it does to some degree, but I mean uh, that is really uh, you know a very small step in the direction of the real democracy. I mean the, the uh, let's say the I I would say the most important influence of the pirate party is on these copyright and intellectual property issues. Okay. No, yeah, well, that's that's what they believe themselves. Yeah. So I mean, and they are also proposing some innovative things. You know, in terms of uh, dem democracy, uh, but the the current system we have, uh, the Republican form of government, is not going to become a democracy because we have a pirate party. Okay. But uh, uh, but, but uh, it it can contribute to uh, uh, de uh, more democracy, can it not? Yeah. Okay. You want to say anything more about the pirate party? No. Nope. <laughs> Have you ever heard uh, Rick Falkvinger, the uh, yeah. person, what is it, the chairman or the... He's previous chairman of the Swedish, Swedish Party. Right. Party yeah. right, right. Yeah. He, by the way, he promotes Bitcoins. I guess you know that. Yeah, well, I mean... But uh, you would expect that, maybe, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, bits, like, uh, you know, Bitcoin uh, has certain limited functions, but it, will, it is not a replacement for currency otherwise. I mean, okay. that's, but people you know, can use it to uh, small trade. Small trade, uh, yeah. Buy and sell stuff, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, okay. if, if you want to buy, you know, some heroin on uh, on the net, you, you, you know, they, people can buy uh, tomatoes from me with bitcoins. I say that. Well, that's fine. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I I rather doubt that uh, that's going to benefit the uh, you know democracy or the economy in, in much. It's peer to peer. Uh, it's peer to peer. Yeah. Well. So. Okay. Hey, let's move on. Uh, the Icelandic court convicts PayPal and MasterCards to pay daily fines until they accept monetary transactions to and from WikiLeaks. Um, Iceland has played a very, very important part in uh, uh, for WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks uh, has very close ties to Iceland. They have even made some strategies together and so forth. And they really support uh, WikiLeaks. Um, um, how, uh, <coughs> uh, but... Uh, even even uh, even though they uh, an Icelandic court convicts uh, uh, PayPal and Mastercards, I haven't seen it uh, make them drop their uh, boycott or censure. They have not opened up PayPal uh, uh, to you. You cannot you you cannot use PayPal or Mastercards now to uh, send uh, WikiLeaks any money. Uh, <laughs> But nevertheless, uh, uh, on Iceland, I, I don't know if they're even saying, if, if they say to Iceland, fuck you, uh, uh, we're not, <laughs> well, but, but ev evidently it, it must mean that in Iceland, uh, I would think it means that uh, you cannot use PayPal or MasterCards anywhere in Iceland because they're criminals <laughs> in Iceland. <laughs> uh, well, I doubt it. Do. Well, I mean, how, this, how do you think this, this is? This is not criminal. This is a civil case. It's I a civil case. Okay, civil case, so, yeah. So they're trying to get the money. That you're basically telling so, them PayPal. You, well, it's do, gonna... you, do you think this would may mean that they that the Icelandic government would stop them for uh, for making business PayPal and Mastercard making business on Iceland? No, what they're trying to do is get money from PayPal and, and the Mastercard. They're giving them a, a fine, right? Right, and, and they're also telling the world that uh, you should have the right to send WikiLeaks uh, money if you want. To well, I mean that's the whole point of it. Right. I mean, the whole point of the... the what, what do you think? Is, is that good or bad, what Iceland is doing? Or, or oh, it's certainly it's good. Irrelevant or it, it's, it's a good that, you know, I mean, if, 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 enough, if enough countries do that, then, uh, you know... It might work. 
it might work. Yeah, uh, I mean, it definitely would work. I mean, if enough countries do it. I mean, but it's that doesn't seem very likely, and uh, certainly not a little tiny country, you know, like Iceland. It's not going to have any effect on anything. They say that it's I, basically I, good. They they are the only ones. Uh, it's the only country that is really no. The Argentina too uh, are the. Uh, Main, probably the only countries that have uh, reacted in a healthy, good way to the economic crisis by letting the banks uh, that were responsible for all this <laughs> pay the pay the bill. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and, and immediately the effect <laughs> is uh, they have very hard times in Argentina and Iceland when they do this, but now they're they're they're, they're growing faster than the average uh, European or American country. Yeah. Country. So, anyway, uh, let's get back to, uh, hey, the first time I saw you was uh, at the Prem Hertoft Eftemede, or the, these uh, lectures, the esteemed Danish academic sexological uh, lecture series held every year since Professor Do Do Dr. Madison, sexologist Prem Hertoft, he retired some 10 years ago. Um, and I've been going to these uh, uh, more or less since then. Um, when did you become interested in sexology? We talked a little bit about uh, sexuality in the United States and Europe, and that you uh, uh, are convinced that there's a, a repression of sex, sexuality in the United States, uh, more so maybe in, than in, in, in Europe. Uh, how deep into sexology have you gone, developed? Well, my interest was triggered by a lecture by uh, Dr. William H. Masters of the uh, Masters and Johnson team that produced the books uh, Human Sexual Response and Human Sexual Inadequacy. This was <clears throat> in the 60s. Okay. And I read these books and, and later some others on dating and mate selection. And I took some coursework at the University of California on therapeutic approaches to sexual problems. Uh, this was a continuation of my interest in clinical psychology, which uh, was what I started at uh, the University of Wisconsin. <clears throat> More recently, it had become clear to me that sexuality must be understood within a social context. This insight was enhanced by lectures I attended at... Uh, in what content? Uh, social context. So, social context, yes. Um, okay, it must be understood in, so, in the social context. Right. I mean... So uh, this was enhanced by lectures I attended at Copenhagen University's uh, Women and Gender Research Group's lectures. So, yeah. okay. so I've had a, a, not a, I wouldn't say it's been essential, but it's been an ongoing interest. Now, but, uh, some of the themes that have interested you and made you go to the uh, uh, Hertog lectures, yeah. Uh, do, do you recall any of the, uh, what, what themes would interest you most? Well, anything giving insight into, you know, sexuality in Denmark. I mean, there was one very good lecture on uh, how it became that uh, pedophilia became a big issue, you know. Okay. Uh, that was very good. But there are many, though, that, uh, you know, shed some light on the situation here. Yeah. You know. Okay. After late, later, I met you at uh, one of the IT political association associations um, um, uh, Danish annual Constitution Day celebrations, uh, which is held every fifth of June in Copenhagen. When did you uh, get interested in uh, IT political associate the IT political association? And uh, to what extent have you been involved in any of their activities, many activities? Well, I've been in, uh, interested in free speech issues uh, for a long time, and the online aspect of free speech is crucial to in my research. Uh, so this has been ongoing, I would say, and uh, I have been involved in uh, different kinds of data protection issues, uh, either in uh, the U.S. or in Europe for a very long time. So IT, the IT political 
association is something I joined and uh, I became uh, most recently a uh, reserve board member, I guess you would say. You're on a board, okay. I, I noticed that uh, you, you, you were the, 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 the mailing list that they have, the debating forum, that IT political. Uh, you are often there uh, joining and, uh, and, and active in, in debates. Yeah, well, I mean, on, when specific things come up that uh, I know something about or are directly related to my research interests, then I normally give comments, you know. This is a, this is a, well. This is a there. There are I think there are five thousand uh, people on this list. Maybe I don't uh, know. A, a, a lot of people anyway, and uh, uh, I think to me uh, that uh, I, I don't study uh, democratic processes and, and so forth that you do, uh, but to me it would seem uh, uh, evident that uh, that this 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 must help democratic movements uh, and people. Common people, this must be get out to. They're they're okay. Most of them are academics, but I think it gets out to a lot of people. Uh, well, I what, mean, the, what they're doing, and to the, to the benefit of uh, working people and unemployed people and homeless people <laughs> for the homeless station. Well, I mean, you know, the the data protection is absolutely crucial for any kind of uh, democratic system. I mean, voting requires that. You know, maybe, maybe IT political association and uh, what do you call it? WikiLeaks <laughs> and uh, the Pirate Party and uh, so forth. Uh, all of the, uh, the, the, the instances fighting for uh, a free internet. This is all a prerequisite to any kind of democratic development on the globe. Well, is that too extreme? What did they do before the internet? Okay. Yeah, I mean, but, uh, I mean, but, but we're in a world now where the internet is Big Brother. If we don't get the opposite of Big Brother, free speech, then it will be a pure fascist dictatorship globally. So actually, we can't even we can't even talk about pre-internet. It is now with the internet, with a free or a not free internet. Well, I mean, I think it's, That's where it's at. yeah, but I mean, it's, it's a very complicated issue, you know, I mean, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to put it in this kind of all in none fashion. I mean, the, the only, due to the way the internet, I mean, the internet is a distributed system, okay? I hope so. And uh, that it's not just an espionage system. system. And, and, and uh, therefore, you know, you really can't control it. Uh, uh, no, no one uh, authority really can control it, and uh, all they have to do the, is pass the SOPRA and all this other stuff. Well, I mean, all everything. all of those things are attempts to maintain the pre-internet climate, where you could. It's worse than that. It's worse than that. Well, of course, it's worse because it, the surveillance is much more intensive. People are right, putting right, every right. last, uh, you know, food. And, and that makes it either or. Excuse no, me. it doesn't make it either or. Okay. I, know. I mean, the, the only either or is shutting down the internet, okay? Which is what they tried to do in Egypt, you yeah, know? Yeah. But I, I mean, most countries. There, there, there are too many advantages for the power. Right, right. I mean, it, it is not, it has come to a point where you simply cannot maintain a modern society without the internet. And if the internet is functioning, you cannot really stamp out, you know, everything that you don't like, because it is a distributed system, okay? So there, there are many ways, but I mean, to, for the, the uh, for the technically unsophisticated user, okay, it not only has to be a possibility to use the internet effectively, but also has to be easy, all right? And, and uh, making it easy does require uh, a lot of things to be going on that are being promoted by WikiLeaks and the various uh, or other organizations, including IT Political Association. You know. Well, if they, if it is that way, uh, there's there's uh, uh, they'll never be able to shut it down. It'll never be uh, so they can't stop free speech. Is what you're saying? Then. Uh, and we don't even have to worry about WikiLeaks, do we? No, you don't have to worry about WikiLeaks because... You don't? You, you do. You do have to worry about 
because the whole prosecution of WikiLeaks is to say to people, look, if you embarrass people in power, you're going to get it. So don't do it. Okay? So, uh, so we, very, have to, we have to embarrass people in power. That's what you're saying. It's important. Well, you have to allow the publication of information and embarrass people in power because if you don't, then you don't have a democracy. Right. Well put. That's well put. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I don't think I have any more questions on that or anything. Uh, do you have anything you want to say? Well, one of the other things you were interested in was my activities in Denmark. Right. Uh, and my primary activity is as the director and senior scientist at the Institute for Social Informatics. And uh, we are currently developing an application called My Turn, which is basically a way of balancing participation in uh, group discussion. It's uh, basically transferring the results from my thesis research at uh, the University of California and Stanford to uh, the mobile phone so that a group of people can meet and uh, they can have a discussion that's guided by this My Turn application, which ensures that uh, the conversation is not totally dominated by a couple of people. Okay? Mm, mm, mm. So that's the immediate thing I'm working on today. And uh, political activism is, is sort of my secondary interest. Yeah. Uh, I've been involved in uh, various groups in Denmark, including uh, the Note to War. Uh, I was very active in SOS Against Racism for a while. I, I was a, became a central figure in the Occupy Wall Street movement here. And uh, this, uh, I discussed some of this at... Did you stay the night over on, no, uh, on the city of Town Hall Square? No, I didn't. <laughs> but, uh, I, but you were there. I was there. there. I, uh, I became the uh, caretaker of the website. Uh, really? Yeah. God damn it, you're into good things. <laughs> and uh, I've also become a f uh, member of the Friends of WikiLeaks group, you know. Ooh, okay. So, uh, political activism is, is uh, a feature uh, of my existence, you know, beyond my research. Okay. <clears throat> So, uh, what I would, what I'm planning to do now is uh, provide a service for users of this app new application. So, when people are using my application, the data will be sent off to a server where I'll have an analysis generated and send them back the results. Okay. Hey, people who want to know more about this, uh, they go onto your blog. Uh, my, it'll be on my blog, or they can just go to myturn.mobi. Myturn.mobi. Which is going to be the place for that particular application. Okay. Okay? okay. Then I've also proposed a model of direct democracy using internet technology. Okay. And that's sort of next on the agenda. Okay. So this the MyTurn application is for a balance of participation in a small group, you know. And the direct democracy is the balance of participation uh, among an arbitrarily large population of users. Okay. And another thing I have proposed is uh, an alternative economy, you know, using computer technology. So like, for instance, you can think of a, a job board, you know, or time exchange. Uh, that's one of the things I gave a short talk on in the open source uh, 2011 conference. Yeah. And uh, project management is part of that, okay, yeah. of, of that uh, reconfiguration re of uh, economic processes. And then I think that we are suffering from, we need a fundamental economic, uh, not economic, but a fundamental philosophical restructuring. Because, of what? well, of the uh, systems that have guided moral development. Of, moral development? Yeah. I mean, like, remember what I was saying before, we were talking about the death of God and how... Yeah. You know, the traditional religious views were just not working anymore. Well, if they're not working, then you need something else. 
Okay? Yeah. And this something else is what I call cosmism. All right? Okay, yeah. And, and cosmism actually... Cosmism, how do you spell that? Cosmism? Cosmism, C-O-S-M-I-S-M. -S -S okay. I mean, it was actually developed by a, a, a Christian mystic in Russia about a hundred years ago. So it's not secular? It is secular. Okay. Because this... Uh, missionary, this, they were secular? Well, this, he wasn't a missionary. He was a, a mystic. Okay. Okay. And uh, see, his idea was that these things that were discussed in the Bible, you know, like the resurrection of the dead and all this kind of stuff, <laughs> he said, well, this is not something you can just wait around for God to do. <laughs> this is God's injunction to us to do it. Okay. okay? And then he said, well, if we're going to resurrect all these dead people, there's not going to be enough room, you know? So we got to get out into the universe. Okay. Okay. He needs a rocket, doesn't he? Well, yes. He actually inspired the person who wrote down the first equation showing how much fuel you would need in a rocket to get off the planet. Had quite a bit. Okay. And, and uh, so basically, uh, cosmism was sort of the philosophical foundation for the Russian space effort, the Soviet space effort. Okay. Okay, so cosmism was the philosophical underpinnings of man yeah. getting into space. Uh, without this, there would be no drive. Well, I mean, if the Russians had not put the Sputnik up, then many of the things we've talked about would have never happened. That's right. You know? That's right. Uh, so, a lot of the problems we're seeing right now are due to conflicts between different religious groups, different ethnic groups, different political views, okay? Yeah. And from a psychological standpoint, you normally have conflicts at one level below the unity, okay? So for instance, if the unity is everyone on this planet, okay, yeah. then the conflict is going to be between different groups of people on this planet, okay? But one of the hypotheses of cosmism is that it's not just this planet that we have to worry about, okay? That there are intelligent beings traveling between the stars, okay? And, and that there, those beings out there are the other guys. And we, America, human beings have to stick together, okay? So if you were able to get people to have those kinds of beliefs, we would have a very sharp drop in armed conflict and other trouble on this planet. Yeah, but then the conflict would be between them and us, right? Yeah. But, uh, oh, where are we? They're, 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 I mean, the, uh, this conflict is uh, very unlikely to happen. <laughs> That's true. Uh, Oh, it's a waste of money. Excuse me. That's my opinion about all these rockets. No, well, well before we say, okay, we, I, I said yes to, we, there was a lot of benefits from all this Sputnik stuff, right? Uh, the internet... No, I mean, the basic... Look, this is the basic, this is the basic problem, okay? What, what is that? Well, the basic problem is that our galaxy, okay, which is sort of our little local island in the universe, okay. contains 200 billion stars. Mm -hmm. That's a big number. Let's say that the chance of life rising around a star is one chance in a million. Billion. One chance in a million. I think it's one in trillion. But go ahead. Continue. Whatever it is. Okay, whatever it is. You can say, if, even if, it, let's say it's one, why do we, why do we compromise? Let's say it's one chance in a billion. Okay. Okay. Which, which is very pessimistic. Mm -hmm. Okay. But even if that's true, even if there's only one chance in a billion, Right. That life will arise at a star. That still means that you're going to have 200 intelligent civilizations in our galaxy. Yeah. You have to get out there, though. Yes, but the galaxy has been around for a long time. Billions of years. And an intelligent civilization, if it was able to travel only at one-tenth of the speed of light, would be able to get across the galaxy 
in one million years. Okay? So if the galaxy's been around for four billion years, okay, that means that there are 4,000 opportunities for an intelligent civilization to spread through the galaxy. As you said before, we would never get there. The, get where? The likelihood of ever meeting uh, uh, other, other living creatures is uh, impro not probable. I didn't say that. And, and, and I didn't, no, no. What I said was that the conflict was improbable. Okay? Okay, well, what, what, <laughs> just meeting them to me would be conflict. It, it, I just don't believe that there would not be a conflict. When, Colum well, when Columbus met all the Indians, it was just conflict. Well, the conflict was in the blood of these Spaniards. Yes, but those Spaniards were not very civilized, were they? <laughs> you think we are civilized? Well, it's not, it's not whether we are civilized. It, hey, is, it God, is whether... Hey, Mahatma Gandhi was right. It would be a good idea. <laughs> it, the question is... Go ahead. We're talking about a, an intelligent civilization yeah. that, where, has, where you find that? <laughs> that has been around for okay. Good. maybe a billion years. Yeah. Okay. This would be a very advanced civilization. Okay. You're for this thing? Heading ahead for, for human civilization on Earth, that they work towards meeting these living creatures? Well, look. Are you in favor of that? To anyone who really understands these numbers, okay. it is inevitable that there are these beings traveling among the stars. Okay, great. In other words, they... Well, yes, it is inevitable, because the, the, the universe is eternal, and anything that is eternal means it's potentially there. It is there. It's, it's just a question of time. Right. But the way the time works out, mm -hmm. okay, under any reasonable assumptions, the only conclusion is that these beings have already been in our neighborhood. <laughs> oh, it's getting more and more fantastic. No, no, this is nothing fantastic at all. If you go over to the Niels Bohr Institute, there's a little volume, and that volume is called 50 Explanations for the Great Silence. Okay, okay. All right. Now, then, the, hey, wait a minute. That, that, that means that these uh, aliens, or whoever they are, they have uh, visited the Niels Bohr Institute, or they've been around... Uh, checking people out. They've been here looking at, maybe they didn't talk with anybody, but they've been here and had a look. Well, that's one hypothesis. That's called the zoo hypothesis. <laughs> this, is, can you, this is really fantastic. Go ahead. I mean, so there are 49 other hypotheses, but oh, the okay. problem is well, yeah. that the way the numbers work out, the hypothesis that there are no alien civilizations just doesn't make any sense okay. at all. Okay. Well, okay? I, can, I can follow that. Yeah. So, uh, this problem was independently uh, thought of by, mm. by two different people. One was the fellow who is considered to be the father of space flight. Uh, what was his name? Do you remember? Shilovsky. Shilovsky. I'm not saying that right, but that's okay. the guy's name. Okay. Yeah. There's a crater on the back of the moon named after him. And uh, then it was independently rediscovered, you might say, by Enrico Fermi, one of the leading physicists of the last century. Okay? Mm -hmm. And he, it wasn't like he was, you know, thinking about this problem or anything. What happened was that he read a cartoon in the New York Times. Okay? Great ideas come from very many different places. Yeah, but I mean, this, this is... This cartoon is in this little volume over at, the, over at Niels Bohr, okay? Mm. And, uh, That's very interesting stuff. It's good. And uh, what happened was that uh, the New York Times had several articles on the previous day, okay? But, and one of them was about the sanitation department was complaining that people were, somebody was stealing garbage cans, mm -hmm. okay? And another little article was that some co-eds up in some little college had seen flying saucers, you know, which just happens very often, you know, around finals times when there's a lot of stress, you know. Mm. 
So the next day there was this cartoon and it showed a flying saucer on the ground and the uh, Martians or whoever they were, were carting these garbage cans off to their flying saucer. <laughs> oh yeah. So, Enrico Fermi was sitting out in the middle of the desert with a whole bunch of other guys who were building the atomic bomb in New Mexico. And the New York Times was one of the few sources of knowledge they had from the outside world, okay? Because they were certainly not permitted to make any communications from that location to the outside, all right? Mm -hmm. So, he, had, he read this, you know, when he was having breakfast or whatever. And then, some hours later, he just suddenly burst out, where are they? Okay, because Fermi had a mind that could throw these numbers around very easily. And he knew how many stars there were in the galaxy, and he knew how far away they were, and how fast you could travel, and all these things. And once you understand those things, it becomes a great mystery why we haven't seen any signs of these civilizations. Well, what's your guess? I think that the zoo hypothesis is the best one. And that's, that was what Chilovsky thought. Okay. okay? okay. And, uh, Have a look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So the reason I say there wouldn't be a conflict, okay, is because... Because they all like that. That's their attitude. That's their... Well, I would... Just look around. I mean, there couldn't be a conflict. With someone just looking around. Well, we can't see them, they can see us. I mean, look, you know, when, uh, when the Europeans went, went to Africa, uh, they were ahead of by a couple of hundred years in technology, right? The, the Europeans had uh, cannons, and the locals had spears. That's right. And they haven't recovered yet. That's right. So we're not talking about a civilization that would be a hundred years ahead of us. We're not even talking about a civilization that's a thousand years ahead of us. This is a civilization that could be a million years ahead of us, a billion years ahead of us. There cannot be a conflict between that kind of civilization and us. So would there be enslavement? Well, there would be if they wanted it. But uh, most likely they have uh, gotten beyond these kind of things. I mean, nobody really knows, of course. But you can't exclude all of you. I mean, or can you? What? Uh, they're... Um, they're, they're, can you be totally certain? Are you totally certain that it's only a peaceful uh, potential meeting <laughs> we would have with them? Well, it's either a peaceful meeting or we're finished. Right, exactly. Take your choice. Okay. And I the, mean, there's. And, and, if, and if they are so advanced, it makes you, you can't really run away. No. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, okay, then, uh, no problem. <laughs> Well, the problem is that people have not realized this. That's the problem. They're still clinging to a belief system that's thousands, thousands of years old. Okay, We're trying to run this world with beliefs that are thousands of years old. I mean, the Bible is a story of how people settled to begin agriculture. It's yeah. people who were previously yeah. herding their cattle along and as nomads, and then they settle down, and then they have some rules, the Ten Commandments, that tell them how to act if you're going to be able to live in peace in a settlement, okay? Yeah, agriculture going in there. So we've been through the agricultural revolution, we've been through the industrial revolution, and now we're in the information revolution, and we're still trying to use the same moral principles, hey... It just does not work. So what are the new moral principles? Well, whatever they are, they're not going to be coming from thousands of years ago. Okay. You know? I mean, you know, you, when you read the Bible, you don't see anything in there about germs. You know, if you don't believe in germs, you're going to have problems, you know? So our, our new Bible is uh, research. Well, the new, the new Bible has to be based on our current understanding of the world. Okay. Okay. I mean, the moral principles are always coming from your view of reality, okay? So when 
when Genghis Khan was big man on campus, the big sin was throwing water on a fire. Why was that a sin? Because if you're sitting in a tent in the middle of the Mongolian plains and it's 50 degrees below zero outside and somebody throws water on fire and the nearest next little hut is 50 or 100 kilometers away, you are dead and the entire family is dead. Okay? So the perception of reality is the foundation for the moral system. But, right. but actually, what you're saying is that by we have to look forward, not backward. Well, we, so then you're saying then you're saying that you can't learn anything from the uh, the uh, the American uh, Indians or any any no no any, 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 uh, no no so-called primitive society. No, I'm not saying that at all. I think they, I think a lot of them have a lot of wisdom. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt about that. But what I'm saying is that if we are going to have a replacement for the Ten Commandments or whatever you know, ancestor worship in Japan or whatever it is that the local thing, the Buddhist uh, principle, you know, that there is no reality, it's just a figment of your imagination. All these, these, okay, ancient moral systems, okay. But you want a new moral system. Well, you cannot have a moral system based on the perception of reality of thousands of years ago. I mean, I guess the, the, uh, the existence of microorganisms is just one example. So, you know, if you don't believe in microorganisms... So Christian morality is uh, outdated. not moral. It's immoral. It is immoral, yes. Okay. You're a provocateur. All of, the, all of these old systems are immoral because they do, not they do not relate to our current reality. Okay? You know. Hey, uh... I'd like to ask you one question here um, that I've just been thinking about. Hey, you, uh, you, you, uh, you are a, a scientist and you're working scientifically and um, you have a social networking democracy. Um, that, means the, that means the people. What about uh, um, and, uh, you use IT technology or you have a conception of IT technology and social uh, uh, networking, d democratic processes. Um, I think Im implicitly understood that this is the pe this is the people you're working for the masses. Yeah. Democratic process for the masses, and in your enter you've been studying uh, cooperatives and so forth. The Danish uh, cooperative movement and movements study. Uh, do, do you have any uh, ideas? Uh, what, what about uh, dem democracy for researchers, academicians, uh, dem democracy at the universities? Do you, uh, do you have a, any, uh, is, are you or anybody doing anything about that? Or is it all about the masses of people? Well, I mean, the, you know, the democracy uh, can function in a workplace or can function in a society at large. So Anywhere. It's a universal yeah. principle. Are yeah. they the same universal principles? Yeah. Wherever you go. Well, I mean... Uh, the scientists, the researchers get together in the same democratic way as uh, people at uh, Tuborg uh, and, uh, who produce beer. Well, I mean, Tuborg is not a democracy. But you would like it to be. You're, you're studying cooperatives and maybe uh, uh, finding, uh, 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 discovering ideas, ways of uh, uh, breweries uh, to be democratic. Well, any. Organized by the people themselves. Maybe even owning the, the firms and uh, throwing the capitalists out. Do you get into that? Well, I mean, the democracy is a decision making procedure, okay? Yeah. So it, you could apply that procedure in any group of people. So you know, in, in a capitalist society, well, it, so in a capitalist society, it's it's basically anti-democratic because it's based on private property. But, well, but, but many many people, the, uh, collective ownership of private property would make it democratic, right? Well, well the uh, the um, uh, I mean, the whole question of private property. Um, is not really a, a direct contradiction to uh, democracy. I mean, uh, 
No, because uh, because the people, the workers, can own the company collectively. Yeah, but yeah, that would be one. Or way. Or, or like it, like they say in America, if all, every worker can go out and buy some shares in anything. Yeah, that's nonsense. But that doesn't give democracy because it's only those who have the most. <laughs> No, 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 they no, rule. No, no, I mean uh, the fifty-one uh, uh, percent, and you rule. Yeah, yeah, but I mean that the uh, the, the, the democratic decision-making process is really totally independent of all kinds of these economic things. I mean, the 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 uh, there there are uh, economic factors that might make you know democracy more or less likely. You know. But uh, you, uh, you cannot uh, make the kind of you know, direct connection you're talking about. I mean, there's too many complications. I mean, so, you know, a, the basic idea of a democracy is that the citizens make the laws. Okay. Uh, hey, hey I, think, I think what I was uh, really getting at, trying to get at, was uh, are you or is anybody working on democratic processes uh, at the universities, at the, where the researchers are working. Is anybody doing studies there and working on this? Well, I mean, I, I'm, there are certainly uh, studies on uh, how to organize the university, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, With democracy in mind, democratic universities, as opposed to uh, what do you call it, uh, capitalist uh, companies, firms, uh, having too much influence? Well, I mean, the, I mean, if, you know, I mean, the idea of a, of a university is that it is a producer of knowledge, right? Right, and not just uh, taking orders from some damn capitalist company. Right, so, you know, that, that's really, uh, the university should be autonomous if it's really going to perform its function. But, but uh, isn't this what the, I mean, even the name, the Copenhagen Business School, isn't that uh, somehow <clears throat> a thorn in the eye of some people who actually believe in a university? No, because that's really an, uh, an applied science place, okay? I mean, it is the, you know, the distinction is that at the university people think and at the business school they do stuff, you know, they actually do stuff. I mean, it's not but clean cut, so but you, I mean... So you're, so you're saying that the capitalist companies have not gained more influence in, in, in this uh, process, uh, the historical development of going from a, you know, just the University of Copenhagen to having a Danish Copenhagen business school, which is on the same level as a university academically, uh, this is not something that represents more influence from business, the business sector. Well, I mean, you know, there's bound to be more influence from the business sector if what you're doing has to have an effect in the world. You know, that's... Is this, do you think it's a positive development? Well, that's not where I think the real problem lies right now. I mean, the problem is that the government has eliminated uh, democracy at the university. That's true at the business school. That's true at the Copenhagen so University. They, okay, the government has done it. Yeah. But, but they're taking orders from the business uh, section. Yeah. I mean, certainly the, the previous administration was a business front. Okay. You know, I mean, that's where their money came from, okay. right? That's their philosophy. Okay, but uh, my original... They, they're trying to turn the university into a business, and they've basically turned it into a dictatorship, okay, because that's their idea of how to run a business, okay? I mean, they, the people in the previous government, the only thing they could understand was to motivate people was money, all right? And so they simply could not understand another organizing principle, okay? And uh, the effect of that was uh, to eliminate democracy at the university. Uh, eliminate what? Democracy. Democracy, yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it also was an attempt to concentrate power in the hands of the, this political group, uh, that was the previous administration, where basically uh, the universities became branches of you know, the education ministry, right? Yeah, yeah.
they, they lost their independence, whatever independence they had before. Do you have any hope for the future? Sure. Well, what's, uh, what's the hopeful strategy, strategy? Well, realistic strategy. Well, realistic strategy. I don't know. I don't know on what level? I mean, I... <laughs> well, getting more democracy at the university. Well, less uh, capitalist influence. Well, I mean, you're. Oh, wait a minute. Less, less bad capitalist influence. Well, I mean, I mean, uh, getting cap- democracy. I mean, you're, they're, 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 I mean you're, you're juxtaposing two things that are really different. I mean, uh, the uh, capitalism is a type of economic organization. And, and uh, democracy is a form of political organization, okay? I mean, you can say that the distinction isn't that important, but, I mean, I think, you know, you really have to talk about those things in different ways. Uh, the most important event in human history in recent times was the decoding of the human DNA. Okay? Because this will basically allow us over the next century to eliminate almost all diseases, vastly extend human life expectation. And uh, these changes will be profoundly disrupting to society. Okay? And basically will be the final blow Sounds like a fascist society. Mm, there's nothing really. All we all we can say is that uh, the current society, the current principles of morality, will be shown to be irrelevant to everyone. There, of course, will be a few people, you know, who hold out, you know, just like there are people now who don't want to be vaccinated or crazy stuff like that. I mean, you know. But uh, the average person will basically see that the entire philosophical foundations of the human race are pretty much shot to hell because we can create life ourselves. We don't need any gods to do it, right? So this is going to be the big thing. And we're going to see uh, basically more and more accelerating changes uh, as we go forward because about every five years there's a doubling in the scientific literature, okay? So we're going to see more progress in the next, well, basically every five years you see as much progress as you have seen in all previous history, you know? This doesn't comfort me. It should. It doesn't. If it doesn't, you're dead. <laughs> if it does, if what I'm saying does work, you could be living uh, in a thousand years from now. <laughs> uh, you mean I could live forever or a thousand years? My lifespan, you're, te- you're speaking of a lifespan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not a question of living long, it's living well. Uh, well. What condition will you be in? But that's what you uh, imply, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sounds like a science fiction freak show. Potential. But I, 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 but I, this, I, this, I, I can, to be fair, I, uh, uh, I can theoretically see uh, some, something positive coming out of this, yeah. Yes, and a new world, completely different world, morally, yeah. Actually, I'd like to see the old morality thrown out the window. That's, uh, <laughs> I have that in common with this, uh, what do you call it, prediction. Yeah, I mean, you know. Okay. But in, in your own mind, if, if the is, old it, one, is, is this a hope for, are you able to tell the viewers that uh, this, is a, this is my hope for the future? It's not a hope. You're, you're it's inevitable. In it's inevitable. Head. Okay, okay. I mean, I'm, I mean, the only thing that could, if, if, you know, if scientific progress stops, then, of course, what I'm saying will not happen. But if scientific progress continues, then we will enter into a, a new age of bio- biology. We will be in space, okay, spreading through the universe. Because <laughs> we cannot stay on this planet. The sun is going to basically expand and s- 
turn the earth into a cinder, right? But that will be in, uh, I don't know, 100,000 years. Much more than that, but the point is, million years. I mean, there's two basic drives that people have. One is their own survival, and the other is the survival of their group. And our group, human beings, will not survive unless we go to another star. <laughs> okay. David Stadolsky. I got to get the pronunciation right. Uh, I didn't add the, the name Stadolsky. Is that of Slavic descent of some kind, Polish or what? It's a Polish name. It's a yeah. Polish name, okay. Yeah. And so I, I never got into uh, what I wanted to ask you initially. Uh, what is your uh, background? Uh, what your 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 family, mother and father, lineage? They come both from Poland. Well, my, my father was born in New York. Yeah, where did he come from? Huh? I mean, where, where did his parents come from? Uh, I, they they uh, all came from uh, Central Europe. You know, my uncle was uh, in the Russian army. Uh, Soviet army? No. Well, Soviet. Pre, pre, yeah, pre Soviet. Soviet, yeah. Soviet okay. I mean, well, he was, he was in the First and Second World War on the Russian side. Okay. 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 So okay. it was the... Okay, Soviet, that's right. It was the Soviet, yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Uh, my mother was born in Poland, in some little town, okay. So, uh, you could say that uh, my ethnic background is uh, Jewish. Okay. Uh, you know, people who came from Poland and so on, uh, you know, Central Europe to the U.S. Uh, during the previous century. Okay. But uh, during, during the Nazi period, uh, your family was not in Poland or what? No, no. They were somewhere else. My mother was already in the in the U.S. Yeah, okay. I mean, she was... So you never got experience that? All this Holocaust stuff, you never... Your family never got into any... That no, I'm not aware of anybody in the family who was directly... Uh, Involved. I mean, the uh, my mother's side. I mean, my father was born in New York, so that was long ago, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but on my mother's side, uh, they basically sent one person, you know, to the U.S. and that person got a job and then earned enough money to bring everybody else, you know. Right. Okay. So uh, they they got out of Europe before the trouble. Good. Uh, <laughs> Good for them. <laughs> Okay, thanks a million for being on the show. All right. Okay. Glad to help you out. Yeah. Bye bye.